So the argument from contingency is hands down my favorite argument for the existence of God. And there's one big reason for this, at least for me personally. The biggest reason is that a couple years ago at this point, I went through a period of doubt where I wasn't necessarily like an agnostic or an atheist or anything, but I was very, very seriously doubting a lot of the arguments for the existence of God. There was one argument in particular that I was wrestling with, and I just remember hearing like a really good critique of this argument and being like, it does kind of seem just like to come down to a clash of intuitions between like the theist side and the atheist side on here. And I can see how like any, you know, a rational person could take this position or this objection and they'd be able to, to, to get out of this argument. And I just remember that having a real profound impact on me and being like, that's probably the case for a lot of these arguments. And then comes the argument from contingency, the version of the argument from contingency that I found in the work of Dr. Josh Rasmussen. Now he has in his work, he's got a couple different versions of the argument from contingency, but one in particular, I remember when I first encountered it, I was like blown away. It, it this, this argument is not the kind, in my view, that you can just be like, okay, this is a clash of intuitions. Like, Someone could just sort of rationally disagree with this. There's objection. There's good objections to it. And I no longer have that opinion. I know that that may sound a, a bit strong to a lot of you out there watching, but that's the view that I eventually came to. That's how powerful I think this argument is. And that's what I truly believe. And I'd be lying if I didn't say that I believe that. And maybe I'm wrong. It could be, it could be that I'm just not seeing something. That's always possible. Uh, but nevertheless, what you're about to hear in this video this is just the introduction for a video where I recorded a four-part series, which was originally scheduled to be a two-parter, but we split it into four parts in the podcast. And uh, this originally was only available on the podcast, but what I wanted to do was make it available because I think it's so important. I wanted to make it available in just like one long video for uh, all everybody on YouTube. So you could just listen to this interview that I did with Dr. Josh Rasmussen on the argument from contingency, just the whole thing through. So... We split it into really two main sections, so it was four podcast episodes, but it was two main sections. We split it into stage one and stage two, so I'll explain a little bit about what those two stages are. So in the argument from contingency, uh, there was a really helpful philosopher back in the day, that uh, guy named William Rowe, who made this distinction in the argument from contingency between there's like, there's basically two parts to this argument, and so splitting it up can kind of see, uh, help us see what part we're, we're trying to focus on at the current moment. So in stage one, stage one is all about establishing, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm currently drinking my uh, cup of joe, as as the, the kids, kids don't, definitely don't say that. And this is not even coffee, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Uh, back to what we were talking about. Stage one of the argument from contingency is all about establishing that there's some kind of necessary foundation for realities, there's a necessary part of reality. And the reason why that's even like a thing is because contingency, the opposite of contingency, is a necessity. So the argument from contingency gets you to a necessary thing, and that's what stage one is all about. It gets you to a necessary foundation of all other contingent things. So that's stage one. And then stage two, uh, traditionally of these arguments, is about making the connection between that stage one thing that you arrived at, the necessary being, the necessary part of reality, the necessary thing making the connection between that and God. So like these divine attributes, how do we know that this thing is omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent? How do we know that those divine properties sort of fall out of this necessary foundation? So that's what stage two arguments are all about. And what's interesting is that atheist philosophers like Graham Oppie, and there, there, this seems to be like a, a trend among academic philosophers, at least in the atheist tradition, there seems to be a move, a shift recently to where they're accepting stage one and they're saying that, yeah, there is a necessary thing or there's a necessary foundation for reality. But what they do now is they get off, they jump ship at stage two. So they say that that necessary thing is just like part of the universe. It, it's not, you know, it's not an agent. It doesn't have the will or intentions or a mind. And so that I, that's to me, that's progress. But it's just a, a sort of interesting sociological note. Um, but to get back on point, so what you're about to hear is the interview that I did with Dr. Josh Rasmussen, where we talked about stage one and stage two, 
in this four part series that's been at this point is up until today has only been available on the podcast in these diff these four different parts. But what I wanted to do is just string them all together into one long video that you can enjoy on the YouTube channel. So that's what you're about to hear. You're about to hear this really, really good and powerful version of the argument from contingency stage one and stage two arguments. And you're going to hear the, the, the argument that basically pulled me out of my period of doubt. And it's just, I think one of the most important things that I've ever done on the channel, even though, you know, obviously I was just interviewing Josh and it's, it's Josh's arguments, but I think it's hands down one of the most important things that we've ever produced. So yeah, that's what you're about to hear. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And without further ado, here you go. Here is my long, very long interview with Dr. Josh Rasmussen on the argument from contingency. You guys, I can't tell you how excited I am to do this podcast. It's been a long time coming. Josh, we, we originally scheduled to, to sit down and record this back in the beginning of September. And now it's October. It's been a long time. I've been... Like I said, I've, I've been so excited to record this podcast ever since before I did the discussion with Alex O'Connor, Cosmic Skeptic on Unbelievable. I wanted to make sure that we did a two-parter series on the contingency argument with you. So first of all, thanks for coming on to the podcast. We've had you on a couple times already on the YouTube channel, but it's, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's awesome to be with you. Great. So for, for anyone who may not be familiar with you, your work. Tell us a little about your background, what you do for a living. And then also I wanted to ask a question from you specifically because I've seen your testimonial video. I think it's on YouTube. You guys can go search it. I'll even put it in the, the podcast show notes. But have sure. you always been a Christian? Like how did, how did that come about? Because I know that you went through a period of doubt and then came back. Ever since I was an embryo in my mother's womb. No, just kidding. Oh. Yeah, so, you know, I think as anybody can relate to when they go through uh, a process of transition from their parents' worldview or their community's worldview, for me, my worldview sort of just completely shattered as I began to have my own questions about things. And so at that point, I would say I didn't really have any beliefs, and I was just on a quest to find out more about the world. And this quest eventually just led me to become a philosopher. So at some point on my journey, I just remember feeling a conflict in my soul between what I might hope to be true and what actually just seemed to be true. And when I, when I felt that conflict, I actually gained, I would say, an awareness of the value and the courage it takes to face reality, to follow reason and evidence, to speak truth. And I just remember making a decision that I was going to just seek truth. So now who I am is a philosopher, and I had to sort of rethink everything um, as a philosopher. Yeah, so I don't know if you want to follow up on that. I mean, there's a lot I could say about my background, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just remember you talking about how you went through this period of doubt. Yes. And, and it changed your perspective, specifically with how you interact with other people who don't believe like you do. Yeah. So let's, yeah, let's, let's yeah. talk about that a little bit. I, I think that that's, that was one of the things that really stuck out to me. And one of the things that I've learned from you and try to emulate is that we don't have to just be so combative and it's like this team versus our team, you know, and we're trying to beat them and right. it, it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. There's a sense of community, you know, that we get from our tribe, from people who think like us. And, but then this can be a problem because we tend to simplify people who are sort of not thinking like us and we imagine why they think what they think and we tend to oversimplify and uh, demonize to some extent. And in my case, it wasn't so much that I was demonizing people who didn't agree with me, but it was that I didn't really understand what it was like to be them. <laughs> uh, and so, and as you remember, specifically when I was in high school, senior year, there was a friend in my biology class and he was just asking these questions about the existence of God. And I had some arguments and, and he had some good questions against my arguments. And I didn't really fully understood what it was like to be him until I had my own questions and stopped believing God myself. And then from that standpoint of just not believing in sort of an ultimate 
great foundation that would design the world with purpose. I realized that my friend, he had a lot of courage to ask his questions because I knew, I, I mean, I knew that it took me courage to, to face reality, to ask my questions. And that helped to break down this, I think, oversimplified view of people. And it also just gave me a compassion and a love for people, like just as people, like people are just people. And I keep thinking about this, even like now it's like a theme for me is I think sometimes arguments get in the way of seeing people because we see their arguments. We think of people through the lens of what they believe or what their arguments are. Maybe they have silly arguments or good arguments. And so we think of them as either sort of kind of silly or kind of sophisticated, but you know, people are more important than their arguments and people can switch arguments. They can switch beliefs. And so for me, it was the shattering of my worldview that, that also helped to break down, I think these sort of invisible barriers between me and other people. And so now it's just all different. When I meet people who see the world differently, I have more of an exciting feeling inside. I want to learn more. I see it's an opportunity for sort of mutual conversation. And ultimately I keep coming back to this principle, which is like that people matter the most, the person matters. And so, I don't know, it's sort of ironic when people get into these arguments and I've experienced this where it's almost like the arguments start mattering more than the person. And it's especially ironic if the argument is about reasons for thinking that people have value, such as maybe an argument for um, people being made in the image of God or something. And then we devalue people in our attempts to try to support those arguments. And so I discovered the irony in myself and that I think helped break me out of that. The idea as you were talking of how arguments can get in the way of people is mind blowing. I'm I'm just thinking about that as we're as we're going along here. Well, let's let's talk a little bit let's sort of set the context for the argument that we're discussing today, which is the argument from contingency. And in part one, the episode you're listening to now, we're discussing stage one of the argument from contingency. And the next episode, we'll discuss stage two. So let's first try to figure out why are we splitting it up into stages? Why is that helpful? I, to me, I think it's a really helpful distinction. I think it was uh, William Rowe who first made the, the distinction between the stage one and stage two. And I think there's even a stage three if I'm not mistaken. But so what, let's talk a little about why we want to break it up into these stages. Yeah, I find it helpful to break the argument into stages because it sort of separates just the different parts of the argument. Like, so for example, you know, what is this argument about? It's about the foundation of things, okay? The foundation of everything. And the two stages together are about a great conclusion about the foundation, in particular that the foundation is itself great, supremely great than which there is no greater. And the first part of the argument focuses not on trying to show that foundation of things is God or is supremely great, but it focuses on something much more modest. It focuses on rather just that there is an ultimate foundation and that it has a nature that allows it to explain all the contingent things that there are. And the reason to separate the stages is because these two conclusions the first being that uh, the conclusion of stage one, that there is this foundation that has this nature that allows it to explain the contingent things, um, is something that people could think is true independently of whether they think that God exists, independently of whether they think the conclusion of the second stage is true. And so I like to think of the argument as it's almost like a bridge with many steps. And so certain steps take you to stage one, and then more steps take you to stage two. And so by separating it, we can sort of focus and get clear on what we're talking about. I want to provide a little bit more clarity on stage one. Yeah. But before that, let's talk about some of the terminology that's going on, because you've already talked about contingency, you've talked about foundation. Right. Let's cover some of the basic terms that we're going to need to understand what's going on, because these terms are actually pretty technical, or at least they, they require some kind of technical definition so that we know what we mean when we're using these terms in this argument. So, so what are the basic terms that we need to understand? Yeah, okay. So first I think it can be helpful just to even say, like, what's the purpose of the argument? And the way that I think of the argument is, is it's a tool. So as, as I mentioned just briefly, 
we can think of the argument from contingency as a tool for investigating ultimate reality. Okay, what's ultimate reality? Well, ultimate reality would be what you might think of as sort of like the ultimate explanation of things, if there is such thing. And the argument from contingency is a tool to get insight into uh, ultimate reality. And so then some of the key terms, obviously one of the terms is contingent. So what does that mean, right? Basically a contingent thing is just something that doesn't have necessary existence. So what does that mean? Well, for example, take a leaf. So a leaf doesn't have necessary existence because you could smash the leaf and it could be completely annihilated. Uh, maybe its parts still exist, but that particular leaf doesn't still exist. So as long as its non-existence is an actual possibility, then it doesn't have necessary existence and it counts as contingent. We need to distinguish contingency from dependence. Sometimes these are confused in popular language. And I think it's because there is a use of the term contingent that does just mean dependent. For, for the purposes of the argument from contingency, contingent doesn't mean dependent. <laughs> so dependence, for example, um, a leaf will be dependent on the causes that produced it. So, you know, the leaf comes up from the plant and the leaf, its existence ultimately depends on whatever ultimately produces it. Without its uh, underlying causes, the leaf wouldn't have existed. And so, in that sense, the leaf is also dependent. It's contingent and dependent. And you might think that whatever is contingent is dependent, but that's a further step. That's a further argument to be made. Just as far as defining terms, we have contingent, we have dependent, and then we have necessary. And so something is necessary if just if it isn't contingent. Uh, it exists, but it doesn't have contingent existence. So then it'll count as having necessary existence. Those are some of the main terms, um, the key terms for stage one. The way that I like to frame contingent is in terms of like, this thing can fail to exist. And you mentioned that with the leaf, like yeah. if you smash the leaf or if you burn it. I mean, another easy example to think of is like a chair. If we threw a chair in a furnace, then it would be eaten up, destroyed, it would turn to ash. So that chair is contingent. It didn't have to be there. Uh, it probably wasn't there for all of eternity. If we right. are talking about a, a chair that we know in our experience, chairs are made by humans. So it didn't always exist. And then it can be snuffed out. It can go out of existence. So this is a contingent thing. It can come into being, it can go out of being. And then I also like to, to just say, well, a necessary thing is like just the opposite of a contingent thing. It's like, yes, that's something that cannot fail to exist. So it has to always be there. It has to be there for eternity. It has to always exist in every, and this is more philosophical jargon. It has to exist in every possible world. But I like how you distinguish between contingent and dependent. Depend yeah. If yeah. we can, what was your definition of dependent one more time? Well, actually, I don't have a definition because I think it's sort of a basic relation, but I was trying to illustrate it with, a, um, example, with an example. So okay. if the leaf is produced by some prior causes that allow that leaf to exist, then we could say that the leaf depends on those prior causes. Uh, maybe if you want to have a definition, you could say X depends on Y means that um, X would only exist if Y exists. There's actually problems with that definition because we can think of necessary things that would only exist if other necessary things exist, but they don't actually depend on each other. But that sort of technical worry aside, that generally X depends on Y, then you know X wouldn't exist without Y, sort of the idea. Maybe, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of an illustration that would help. So if we're thinking about a movie, okay, a movie is made by humans. So a movie yes. is dependent upon the existence of humans at least the movies in our world. Right. Right. I think that's an easy way to, to think about it. If we take away the and humans. And the movies wouldn't exist, right? Like if the humans didn't produce them. Yeah, so right. That's the idea. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to, we're still talking about stage one and why this is important. So what you already mentioned, the goal of stage one is to talk about yes. the foundation of reality, how it's a necessary kind of thing. Yes. Uh, so let's also talk about, this is something that I, I really like to uh, emphasize and, and I also did this in my discussion with Alex was atheists can endorse stage one. You don't have to jump off ship right at this point in stage one of the argument. You can actually accept stage one 
and then you can get off at stage two, right? So, so right. let's talk about that a little bit and, and how the, the, the reach, I suppose, maybe that's a bad way to put it. Stage one can appeal to all sorts of people. It doesn't have to just appeal to Christians, to theists. It can appeal to anybody. Yeah, right. So, you know, in, in the exchange I had with Graham Oppie, for example, he would accept the conclusion of stage one, or at least that's his preferred theory of things, that there is a uh, initial item, foundational item that has a necessary nature. It cannot fail to exist. Uh, its existence is necessary. And yet he would decline to think that this foundational thing is supreme in nature. And so that's something we'll look at when we look at stage two, but one could right be an atheist and endorse the conclusion of stage one. And I, I recommend that. <laughs> so if you don't believe in God, I, I recommend stage one. And I recommend it just because to be very honest with you, I think it's uh, a sound argument. Okay. Well, let's, let's move on to in your work and what I've noticed, cause I, I read a lot of your work. You may not know that people may not know that I'm, I'm joking, of course. But what I wanted to say was that I've noticed you use a lot of different routes in establishing your conclusions. You like to have a lot of different, maybe bridges is the, the right term. You like to have a lot of routes, a lot of roads to the same place. So let's talk about some of the different routes that you've discovered or that you've, you, you also mentioned that you like to, to be a sort of creator of these new ideas and help to think creatively yeah, so let's talk about some of the ways that you've defended stage one and go from there. Yeah, so, I mean, just right away, I want to just address a worry that someone could have. So you might worry that maybe I'm sort of starting with the conclusion in mind, and then I'm just trying to find routes to that conclusion. And you might worry that that's not really a reasonable way of like finding truth, right? This is post hoc rationalizing. But on the other hand, even before I respond to that worry, I would like want to acknowledge that worry. Like that's a legitimate worry. So I think when we're looking at these pathways, we want to, you know, keep in mind kind of like what's our goal. So if our goal is truth, then, you know, we want to find out, okay, are these pathways actually reasonable? Like, do they actually lead us to truth? And one of the reasons that I've explored many different pathways is because, well, it really was inspired originally I first started this back in college and it was inspired by just this curiosity about whether I had made some mistake in my thinking. So, you know, first I found a kind of simple pathway where we argue from a principle of explanation and perhaps the simplest way to put it would be if we want to try to explain contingent things. Ultimately, we can't appeal to just contingent things provide the, an ultimate explanation of contingent things, because that would be circular. That's like creating the chickens in terms of chickens. Like, I mean, uh, even if you have an infinite regress of chickens, you don't have sort of an ultimate explanation of why there are any chickens at all, just by appealing to chickens, right? So in, in a similar way, even if there's an infinite regress of contingent things, you're not going to explain why there are any contingent things at all. You're not going to have an ultimate explanation unless there's something that's not itself contingent. And by definition, the only thing that isn't contingent would be a necessary thing. So this is one pathway to a necessary foundation for contingent things. Uh, but I remember when I was in college and I was asking people what they thought about this pathway of reason. And one of the questions people would ask is like, well, why I think there is an ultimate explanation? Maybe some things have an explanation, but maybe when it comes to sort of the ultimate explanation of contingent things, that's just brute, right? And so, I mean... One response is to give arguments for thinking that there are, that, you know, that there is an ultimate explanation. Um, so that's one pathway that I explored. But a different pathway I explored is instead of take a route from possible explanation. So I remember I just asked, well, do you think that as far as logic goes, it's logically possible for there to be uh, an explanation for any contingent state of things? And many of the people who were skeptical or who questioned whether there's an ultimate explanation found it quite plausible that there was at least a logically possible explanation. And, and so then I found a pathway that moves from a logically possible explanation to the possibility of a necessary foundation of things. And then using recent developments in the logic of necessity and possibility, 
I was able to show from there a pathway from the possibility of an necessary being or necessary foundation to its actual existence. So here's two kinds of paths, one from actual explanation and then another from possible explanation. Would you like to comment on any of the of those paths at this point? No, I'm I'm just listening. I'm actually waiting to hear, and I don't know if you're actually gonna discuss it or if you were planning to, but in your work and on your YouTube videos and stuff, I've seen you actually use another pathway even from dependence. And I, I've, yeah. that one, I haven't seen anyone else defend. And maybe that's just a matter of me being so focused on your work because I love it so much. But let's maybe talk about that one a little bit and, and we can come back and discuss the other one. Cause I do have some things that I want to say. Yeah, sure. And I mean, and by the way, uh, there's my website, necessarybeing.com, where people can sort of explore for themselves a number of pathways. Is there, I just ask questions, and then based on your answers, I ask more questions. And so, yes, there's many different pathways. A more recent pathway, I mean, this is after finishing graduate school, and as I began to just think again about these things from another angle, I was struck by, I'm always looking for, like, what's the clearest? Okay, this is like a, a, a tool that I use in thinking about things. If things are unclear, then I try to find, okay, what's the clearest? And one of the things that struck me as being clear is that there can't be a cause that exists outside of all that exists. Okay, because if there were a cause that exists outside all that exists, then since it's outside all that exists, then it doesn't exist. But then if it exists and doesn't exist, that's a contradiction. And it seemed like manifestly clear that there can't be this contradiction of something that exists and doesn't exist, right? So, for, but now, even though it's so clear, even though it's clear, it's not actually a trivial thing that there's no cause outside all that exists. And, and same for explanation. If there's a difference between cause and explanation, we still have the result that there's no explanation outside all that exists. There's no ground outside all that exists. There's nothing, right, outside all that exists. And what this implies is that if you think of existence in total, there's nothing beyond existence in total that explains it. And this is actually pretty puzzling because when we think of examples of things that exist, uh, both small things and big things, both individuals and wholes, both individuals and plurals taken together, like the plural of laptops, let's say, there is a cause outside of them that explains their existence. And this is sort of puzzling. I mean, like, l- let me just use an example. So I'm thinking now about my laptop. It exists, um, and there's a cause that explains its existence. And it's because of the kind of thing that the laptop is, it's just the kind of thing that depends on other things. It wouldn't exist without other things, uh, having produced it. But now we can just, like, imagine in our minds that we subtract out everything outside of the laptop. We just subtract out like the rest of the universe, so that the laptop is all that exists, okay? So in this imagination, the laptop now occupies the totality of reality, the totality of existence. But now, by subtracting everything out in our mind, we realize that that the laptop, in this case, in this sort of imagined world, doesn't depend on anything else, because we just subtracted out everything else that it could depend on. But that seems like a problematic world to imagine because it seems like the laptop is the kind of thing that does depend on other things. And so its dependent nature, it would still be dependent in its nature, no matter like what other things happen to exist or not. It's sort of like the nature of the laptop to require other things. And so this takes us back to the puzzle. How can there be something that doesn't depend on other things? Like merely adding up dependent things together Uh, dependent laptops together into an infinite stack of dependent laptops doesn't seem to yield an independent kind of realities. Like dependence can't add up to independent, maybe a way of thinking about it. From dependence only comes more dependent. In my recent book that I'm I'm writing, I call this a construction error. You can't construct uh, independent reality or an independent totality of things purely from dependent things. But then this brings us back to the puzzle. How can the totality of things have an independent nature? And the only solution that really makes sense to me is that reality in total has to have within it something that is itself independent in its nature, something foundational, 
that then can explain why reality in total doesn't have an outside cause or explanation. Because the idea is that the foundation of reality can itself be caused. It has an independent nature. And so this independent nature is the source of the fact that reality in total has no outside explanation. Okay, so this is sort of an abstract route. Uh, come back to me. Tell me where you would like me to clarify. Well, let's be honest. All of this is going to be really abstract. Where we're talking about contingent things and like a necessary foundation for all of contingent reality. It's like when we start to talk about these terms and especially when we're talking about dependence and adding dependence and you can't get independence from dependence. Like this, this language just starts to get really, it boggles the mind. Especially like you can try to slow it down, but ultimately we're going to lose people. And so what we can do is maybe I can just suggest that if you're having trouble following along, remember where you are and just go back and listen to it again, listen to it again, or even go check out some of his, his YouTube videos. Like he, he does it in a really nice presentation on his YouTube channel, which I'll have in the show notes and everything. So don't worry about that. But if we can try to sort of summarize and I'm going to see what I can do here. I'm thinking about, because I've actually watched pretty much all of your videos on this. And this pathway for stage one is one of the more interesting ones to me because maybe just because I'm more familiar with the other ones. Those are the ones that I sort of, when I was getting into apologetics, mm-hmm. William Lane Craig uses the the version of the expl- explanation of everything. So the independence, the dependence route is really, really different, intriguing. So I think I was, I was actually trying to think of, of an illustration that might help. So like if we're, imagine we have a swimming pool and we're pouring water in it slowly. Okay. We're not going to like fill up the swimming pool with water and then suddenly get fire. That's not going to happen. And it sounds like that's the same type of situation that right. is going on with these dependent objects. So you talked about your computer. I'm looking on my desk yeah. right now. I've got a mouse. I've got a phone here. I've got a glass of water. If we start to add these things up, we don't just magically get something that exists independently, right? But the question is, how is that possible, right? Is that the the, the sort of basic idea? Yeah, I mean, so I like your swimming pool analogy. I mean, like, so if, if all you have is like this water and you're just adding more and more water, all you're going to have in total is just water, okay? Yeah. And in the same way, if you have dependent stuff, and you add more and more dependent stuff, all you're going to have is dependent stuff. The totality will be dependent. But that contradicts the uh, the, the point that the totality can't be dependent because there's nothing for it to depend on, nothing beyond it. So in order for the totality to even exist at all, we need something that isn't dependent sort of at the ground layer to support the dependent things. It's sort of like something beyond the water in the pool to support the water in the pool, something that isn't water that, you know, something else, right? <laughs> something of another nature, because without, without something of another nature, everything's just dependent through and through. And by dependent, we mean dependent on something beyond itself. So then the totality would be dependent on something beyond itself. But that leads us to a contradiction. There's nothing beyond the totality. So what about if we just had dependent things all the way down? Right. So the infinite regress, issue, right? And here I think it's important to realize that the problem of dependence really has nothing to do with the number of things that exist. It's sort of like, uh, I like, the, I'll continue with the water analogy. It's like, imagine you had water all the way down, okay? Would you have fire? No, you wouldn't have fire. You would just have water all the way down. It's sort of in the same way, if you had dependence all the way down, would you have an independent reality? No, you have dependence through and through. The whole reality would be dependent. Every part's dependent. The totality would be dependent. And I mean, at this point, somebody might worry like, well, you know, why think that? Like maybe if you have enough dependent things, then somehow the totality is independent somehow, right? But one reason to think that it doesn't work this way is just by our experience. I mean, every example of dependent things added together is still just a dependent thing. If we have a bunch of iPhones added together, we still have the totality of iPhones has to be invented by something that's not itself already an iPhone. Otherwise, you get a circularity. And um, so if we have no counterexamples, then we could support this as a principle that makes sense of our universal experience, as well, I think, of just basic principle of reason that independence just doesn't add up to independence. We could just sort of see this by the light of reason. Okay. And so the, but it's, it should, 
be obvious to everybody that when we're considering all of reality, all of reality has to be independent, right? It can't, the, all of the totality of reality can't be dependent on something else. Right. Something beyond it. Yeah. I mean, you might think maybe it's dependent sort of on its parts somehow. Um, and so, but then that's why we have to make sure we're, we're clear when we're defining our terms. You know, there's dependent on something beyond yourself. And the idea is you can't, the, well, this is like, this is the notion of dependence we're working with. The idea is you can't take things that are dependent on something beyond themselves and derive from that um, a reality that's um, itself not dependent on something beyond itself. And reason and experience seem to confirm that inference. Okay, so what we have to do, in this, and this is, again, we're, this is one pathway yes. to affirming stage one. You, you already mentioned two others, and we're going to go come back to those actually in just a moment. But so this, in this one, we're just going to say that this is a puzzle that we found. All of reality is independent, but everything that we see in reality, everything that we interact with at least, is more or less, from what we can tell, dependent. Yes. And so how do we get independence from purely dependent things? Yes. Computers, mouses, this microphone that I'm talking into. How do we get an independent reality from just purely things that depend on other things? And that's a big question. How do we how do we fill up a swimming pool with water and get fire? Exactly. Can't do it. Maybe so maybe what we have to do is start with fire and then we can have fire and water side by side. Maybe you're having a cookout. Right. Outside in there in your backyard. Well, anyways, Okay, did you have any other thoughts there? And just, just to be clear, so in this case, fire represents... Independence. Something that uh, has no outside explanation. And then like water represents dependent things. Yeah. So that's why we need to get fire, because we know there's something without an outside explanation, namely the totality of things. And we got there using the law of non-contradiction. And th this is a really important point. That, I mean, I think this is, this is why I became intrigued with this pathway in the first place, was because I, I realized that uh, the other pathways they take a while to get to this conclusion that there's some reality that's uncaused. So either there's some principle of explanation or there's maybe an argument against an infinite regress. So the first member has to be uncaused. And so then people will press against those pathways in various ways. And what I notice is that, well, we can just use a law of non-contradiction and get very quickly to a reality that's uncaused. We just apply it to the reality as a whole. Now we have a reality that's uncaused. That's like the fire, right? It's this reality that's uncaused. And so, but how can there be this fire, this uncaused reality? That's puzzling when everything in our experience is dependent and caused. So that's the puzzle. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still thinking through this myself. And I'm, I, I can't tell if I'm happy that I use that analogy or not because it's sticking in my mind and now I'm trying to think about swimming pools and fire. All right. Back to these, these first two pathways. And probably, I think this one has to do more with the first one, because you wrote a book with Alexander Proust recently called Necessary Existence, I think it is. Yes. Necessary Existence. And you give a really interesting defense of the principle of sufficient reason, which is just the principle of explanation, as you put it. And in my debate with Alex O'Connor, again, that's Cosmic Skeptic, I simplified this argument that you give by saying that basically the universe is predictable. Mm -hmm. And so here's a, a quick illustration. I'll make a prediction right now. There are no tigers that are going to jump in my room or come into being when I snap my fingers. I'm going to snap here on, on the, into the microphone real quick. Hey, my prediction was correct. There's no tigers in my room. Thank God. <laughs> so the question is, though, why can I make these types of predictions? Mm -hmm. Why isn't the world sort of just unpredictable all the time? And a really simple answer is that contingent things just can't do that. They must always be accompanied by some kind of reasonable explanation. A tiger doesn't just jump into a room, it has to come from somewhere and be placed there. There's got to be some reasonable explanation. And so, But in the book, you have a much more rigorous defense of this, and I wanted to talk briefly about that because it was one of the more powerful arguments I think I've ever seen in defense of the pr uh, principle of sufficient reason. So let's, let's talk about that just a, a little. Yeah, I like how you put that. Uh, so yeah, we give several different arguments for a principle of explanation, and there are different versions of the principle. We end up using a modest version, although we also defend, well, anyway, there's different versions of the principle, but for our purposes, just we can stick with, the, with what you just said, which is that contingent things 
exist because of some explanation, some cause that produces them, something that leads to their existence. And uh, the argument that you gave is similar to the argument from chaos that we developed, which is basically if we don't have some principle of explanation, then we have this problem of chaos. It's the problem of understanding why things don't just randomly pop in and out of existence all the time, right? What accounts for this sort of uniformity of our experience? And at the deepest level, I mean, we can maybe explain the uniformity by physical laws, but then that doesn't give the sort of deepest explanation because why don't those physical laws snap out of existence, right? Like, you know, there's the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force and, and the law of gravity, right? Like, why don't those laws just cease today at 4.30, right? And then be replaced by other laws. And so the, it's the same problem of chaos all over again. And uh, I like how you put it. Yeah, the sort of deepest explanation is going to be in terms of this principle of explanation that contingent things don't just exist without some explanation beyond them. And that explanation then accounts for the order of things. It makes sense of why contingent things aren't coming in and out of existence all the time. I mean, so there's more we could unpack. I mean, one of the things we do in the book is we also give a probabilistic development of that argument. I mean, maybe this is what you're referring to. Yeah, that part of the argument was something that kind of blew my mind as I was reading through. I mean, the whole book is mind blowing. You've got to really take your time with it. But that that part, and especially when you were talking about like, well, let's imagine this category of things, contingent things that have no explanation. And let's imagine like how many things are in that set of things how many are are yeah. in that category yeah. yeah that was the probability thing yeah so think about like how many possible contingent things like don't exist maybe these are possible futures right like there's a building that's 4000 feet tall and a building that's 5000 feet tall and and plato and just random ghosts or whatever maybe ghosts aren't possible whatever like pick all the things that you think are possible there's an infinite set of different such things right and so how likely is it that not one of them ever comes into being within your field of view, especially if they all could, if any one of them could? I mean, <laughs> if, if, if you say that they can't, they can't come into being, well, then that's exactly what the principle of explanation predicts. So that's, that makes sense, right? But let's, let's say you want to avoid believing in this principle of explanation. You know, e even just for the sake of argument, you want to see, is it possible to be um, to go without the principle. Well, then you have this problem of accounting for the ex the the enormous improbability that like none of these imaginary things that could exist, just like they never do. But why? There's so many. And so yeah, so Bruce and I we develop a kind of rigorous probabilistic formulation of this where we um, talk about the sets and we talk about non-zero probability of arbitrary sections of things just coming into being or going out of being. And then it turns out that the probability that none of these things ever come into being, if, if the principle of explanation is not true, uh, approaches zero, just given the infinity of things. So without an ex so, so this is a, a pressing motivation to have some explanation for why there's this order to things, an ultimate sort of deep explanation, not just appealing to laws that themselves could go out of existence. We need an explanation of contingent things. All right, so we're going to move at this point to discussing some of the objections to the contingency argument, at least we're, we're still talking about stage one. But before we do that, in your work, you make a distinction between objections and barriers. And I think this is also really important. Here's my attempt at the distinction that you make here. So objections help us sort of test a view or a hypothesis, but barriers keep us from taking a view seriously. I wanted to get your thoughts on that attempt at explaining this distinction. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. I've been thinking about even just the role of arguments and even maybe the problem with arguments. Um, so, like, I mean, one of the good things about arguments is it can help people to organize their thinking so they can see new things. But one of the problems with arguments is that it, it can be uh, used, uh, arguments can be used as weapons in ways that kind of like put people down or make people feel judged. Like, for example, there can be a situation where somebody says, you shouldn't believe that because you have no argument for believing that. And then the person who does believe that maybe feels defensive. And so they say, well, here's why 
I believe that. And then they give the argument. But then the skeptic who doesn't believe it now feels like they need to defend their reasonableness by showing there's a problem with the argument. And then there, what happens is an infinite battle happens because of, of the argument. And this is connected to the beginning of our conversation where you brought up uh, something that I, I'm concerned about, which is a kind of problem with with polarization and with people fighting for different tribes and they sort of lose sight of, of the value of people in the conversations. It's just like people are battling against people instead of seeking to use arguments to serve people. So going back to this distinction between objections as tests versus barriers as obstacles, I like to think of objections to an argument as a way of investigating that argument, sort of testing whether it's a good argument, testing its primacy, right? But sometimes there's something else, which isn't really an objection, but more like a barrier to even taking the argument seriously. Because let's say the argument's been weaponized. Let's say that I've had this experience even recently. Somebody was endorsing an argument that I myself think is sound, but they didn't know who I was. And they were treating me like I was somebody that they needed to like prove was wrong. They didn't even know who I was. And I instantly found myself wanting to be skeptical of an argument that I already think is sound just because I felt like they were bullying me with the argument. Um, and so <laughs> this is an example of where barriers can arise because of the association with argument, with those arguments being used as, as weapons, or even just with the conclusion of the arguments. Maybe there's reasons to doubt that conclusion. And so then those reasons become barriers to even taking seriously the argument, especially an argument for something like the existence of God, for example. Yeah. As you're talking about this, I, I'm thinking barriers seem more like psychological in, in their, their sort of nature. Whereas objections, I mean, objections can be psychological depending on like what type of person you're talking about and whether or not they're thinking about primarily objections or if they're trying to accept a view. Yes. But I, I think that's that's helpful yes. to make this distinction. Barriers are, are more in terms of like a, a psychological block or a barrier. Sure. Because in your response and how we can remove barriers, I think that's going to be important. Yes. Yes. That's a good way of characterizing the difference. So how can we help people to kind of remove some of these barriers or and even not not to help other people, but how can we present arguments Maybe that as we're presenting them, we can begin to remove barriers along the way. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this. I mean, in some ways, I almost feel like even more important than developing sound arguments is understanding just like how to present arguments in ways that are, are winsome. Uh, I think intellectual virtues are key, right? Like, so are we actually uh, humble? Are we careful? Um, are we presenting the argument with an attitude of service towards somebody, or is it to more justify ourselves uh, or to pr prove to people that we're reasonable? Uh, I mean, I, and I feel this temptation. Like if somebody says like, I'm, I'm a silly person, I shouldn't believe X, Y, or Z. I'm not reasonable in my thinking. Then I find myself almost like tempted to try to justify my own reasonableness to them. Right. But then, you know, I mean, how, how, how helpful is that going to be for them, especially if now they're feeling defensive because I'm trying to prove them wrong, right? So intellectual humility, um, seeking rapport, seeking to serve, to add value. I think these really go a long way to removing barriers to inquiry. I often think of like truth flows like a river, um, but then these barriers block that river. And before we come up with stronger arguments or whatever, we almost just need to unblock the river by seeking the intellectual virtues, being humble, being careful, seeking truth, um, having the courage to follow reason, these sorts of things, being willing to be wrong. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll just ask somebody, you know, like, help me see what I'm missing. You know, and sincerely, like, not as a way of having power over them in the conversation, but like, you just sincerely wanting to to learn right from them. And, and, and I can even be sure of my argument, but Oftentimes, even though I'm sure, I, I won't really see ways in which things are unclear or maybe my sureness is, is actually unfounded. And by just asking the question, like, help me see what I'm missing, I'm much more likely to see what I'm missing and then also at the same time remove the barrier. 
And I could give you lots of stories of conversations I've had with people where it was a productive conversation, where on both sides, we gained deeper insight on this particular argument from contingency, weaknesses and potential strengths, just through intellectual uh, seeking to be virtuous in our, in our way of thinking about the argument. I think something that can happen, especially with apologists, because you, you go through and you learn about an argument, you read about it, you look at the objections and you're like, oh yeah, all the objections are so bad because you're as an apologist, you know, that's, that's your viewpoint. You're coming from this view of, and a lot of us, well, I don't, I don't want to say how many, cause I, I honestly don't know, but if you're coming from a position of like, you were already a Christian or you were already a theist and you're looking at these arguments, sometimes what you want to do is you want to go into a conversation and you want to just kind of beat somebody up with this argument and say, well, look how rational Christianity is. Look how rational I am. Well, especially if you feel defensive, if you feel like they're saying you're not rational and you want to like prove them, no, 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 like, but I am rational, right? <laughs> so that's really Yeah, that's, that's true. And what I'm thinking about is actually I was listening to a TED talk on how to have good conversations with people. And I was, I was listening to this in my preparation for my debate with Alex, actually, because I wanted to figure out like how, how, and I think this was actually along the same lines without even knowing about it. But basically one of the things that she mentioned, she listed like 10 different things. I can't remember the actual figure, but one of the things that she mentioned that really, really stuck out to me and an area that I often fail at is in going into a conversation and you already talked about this, but going into a conversation and thinking that you already have all of the answers and they have nothing to give you. They have no deeper insights. They have no genuine objections. That's, I think, one of the biggest pitfalls of apologetics and in talking with other people is that we don't consider the basic idea that this other person you're talking to is not an idiot. They they may have insights and they may actually have a really good objection that you didn't know about. And so what we need to do is when we go into these conversations is to assume that you can learn something from this person. And I think when we have that attitude and we go in thinking that, hey, I might learn something really key or really interesting that I haven't thought about before and I need to think about, if we go into a conversation with that attitude, I think that we can make a lot of progress in terms of removing these barriers. And you mentioned the other intellectual virtues and whatnot. But I think if we start there, yeah. I think everything else is going to kind of flow out of that. Yeah. And I just want to add, you know, really seeing the person you're talking with as the treasure in the conversation, like they are the most important thing, like not the argument, not even what truth is revealed or whatever. And this is something, I mean, I, I've failed at this. I'm, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to be better at just having that rapport. I've had conversations where I could tell that the problem, that there was like a problem in a conversation is that um, they viewed me as in, in sort of an enemy that they didn't have trust. And one of their worries was that um, it's like, I have to remember that when they're talking with me, they're actually kind of sometimes talking to a type. It's like, they don't know me personally. So they're actually talking, they're thinking about like the 10 people of the same type that they talked with before me. And then if it looks like I'm trying to give an argument for a conclusion, one of the common worries is that I'm starting with the conclusion and I'm not sincerely interested in the truth. Like I'm more just trying to just convince them. And that's, I th in my experience, that, that's a turnoff. Like people want to feel like they're valued and that there's a kind of cooperation in the conversation. It's not like I'm superior. I have the truth. It's just what you said, you know, like coming into the conversation, willing to learn and but, and I just want to add this other element and, and see, really seeing and even feeling that the other person is valuable and like, and they're the treasure because other, otherwise it's almost like it's pointless and they can kind of pick up on, on that. Like they'll feel used, like you're using them to, I don't know, like win your argument or make a point or something. And we don't like to, I, mean, I know what it's like to feel used. We don't like that. So in a way, this is all common sense, but but it's like not, like it's not common. It's just so not common, Cameron. It's just not common. And I feel like we could really just kind of change the world if, if enough people, if there's like a critical mass of people who really get this, who understand like 
we can unblock the truth from flowing. We can unblock the truth flow. Uh, I think of like just flowing from place to place, like as people unlock insights, as we really figure out how to have these conversations in a way that doesn't turn people off and people don't feel polarized by them. So like if we can figure that out, then everything else becomes a lot easier and more fun and more productive. Well, let's swing back to stage one and let's talk about some of the most common objections you hear when discussing the contingency argument with students. Yeah, sure. Probably first, the argument from the infinite regress, people bring this up, you know, why couldn't each contingent thing just be caused by another contingent thing ad infinitum and there's no first contingent thing. And so that's just it. Uh, that's probably the most common objection for one of them. Well, actually, what, you want me to? Yes. Yeah. As you're as you're listing, it, why, why don't you just list them? Because we actually are, are planning on discussing some of those. So just okay. sort of list some of the more common ones that you that you hear, and then if we don't sure. if we don't have it sort of in our outline here, then then we can cover it if we need to. Right. So then there's the fallacy of composition that it's a mistake to infer that the totality of contingent things has some feature like is caused or is explained from uh, the fact that just parts of that totality have that feature like is caused or is explained. So the fallacy of composition. There is also this argument from quantum mechanics that we can actually get uncaused things because we have these particles that just appear from nowhere like virtual particles and there's no sort of determining cause of them. That's one that comes up. I mean, in, in my classes, to be honest, a lot of it is just clarifying questions like, okay, Tell me what this term means. Well, I actually wanted to add a clarification that does come up from students, which is um, understanding that a contingent thing, when we say it, it can fail to exist, and if we say necessary thing has necessary existence, that doesn't mean, to say that it has necessary existence isn't to mean that it's necessary for something. So students will sometimes get confused about this. They'll say, like, a chair is necessary for sitting on, so it has necessary existence. And I had a hard time explaining to them, like I used the term could fail to exist. I tried to find different ways. Finally, I just asked the students like, okay, how would you define contingent? Because some of them got it, but then some of them just didn't. And there was this one girl and she offered a definition that this other students understood. So I just want to like throw this out too, which is a contingent thing is something that could be gone. That's how she put it. It could be gone. Okay. So that's an example of like an objection that comes up. It's just a clarifying objection. Okay, what do you, what do you mean by a contingent? And I wasn't sure actually in your exchange with Alex if some of his objections were actually more rooted in still trying to clarify the concepts because you know these are sort of deep concepts. On that note, one of the objections that he raised was he wasn't convinced that there were any contingent things, and he seemed to adopt determinism. In defending this and if you guys want to listen to that episode I've got it in the show notes it's really easy to to go back and listen to if you want to but determinism is basically the idea and I was trying to think about the best way to put this quickly is that there are no genuine choices so like a tree when it grows a branch the branch doesn't have a choice whether or not it was gonna grow so all events including our choices are sort of caused to happen by prior events. That's the basic idea behind determinism. And so what he was saying is that determined, if the world is determined, then there are no contingent things. And my initial reaction was to say that there's a difference between something that is determined and something that is necessary. And I gave an illustration of a gumball machine, which came up actually a lot in the, in the conversation, but I'm curious to see how you would have responded. Would you have just tried to clarify what the terms meant? How would you have responded? Yeah, I mean, I thought your clarification was was good. I mean, at one point I was kind of wondering whether he was thinking that the foundation of things is sort of automatically necessary. So the idea is that if everything's determined, then everything would be necessary because everything would be, well, either there is a foundation or it's just an infinite regress, but in either case, from everything being determined, it just automatically follows that everything is necessary. And then I was thinking it might be helpful just to clarify that we could distinguish between different possible worlds where maybe in one world, everything is determined. Maybe in another world, 
there's just a single chunk of cheese. <laughs> uh, and then there's another possible world where maybe things are indetermined. And I wasn't sure if, if he would allow for alternative possible world, or if he was really thinking that there's only one possible world. But probably the response I would have given would just to be uh, just to go ahead and just grant, like, okay, let's say everything is necessary. Well, then that completes the first stage of the argument, right? Because the whole point of stage one was to try to show that there's some necessary part of reality, some necessary thing. And so then we can move on to stage two and investigate here, what's the nature of the necessary thing. If everything's necessary, then we can look at stage two and, and unpack some of the features of a necessary thing. If it turns out that, well, some of the features revealed by stage two are incompatible with some of the things we find in our universe. Okay, well, we can discover that later when we get to stage two. But it, but as far as stage one goes, it's not really a good objection to stage one to say, well, everything's necessary because that's the conclusion of stage one. Yeah, we actually talked about this right after the podcast and I, or the, the discussion that I had with him. And I really, really wish I would have thought of that at the time because it, it is sort of obvious. It's like if you want to deny that th there are contingent things, well, then you're already saying that there's a necessary thing in reality. Or that there's nothing, right? Like the nothing exists, right? But... <laughs> But that wasn't on the table. So. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about another objection. This is called the fallacy of composition. You already mentioned it earlier. And basically, the idea is that just because some contingent things have explanations or causal explanations, my computer has a, an explanation from a factory, a bunch of people worked on it, developed it and everything. That doesn't mean that all contingent things have causal explanations. That's inferring from parts to wholes. And sometimes those inferences are bad. For example, every part of an elephant is light and weight, but that doesn't mean that the whole elephant is light and weight. So how do we know that we aren't making a, a similar flaw in our reasoning when we're thinking about... And again, this, is, this actually only affects pathways one. And I think it's actually only pathway one here. It doesn't even affect pathway two or three. But let's talk about the fallacy of composition. Yeah, so I, I like how you how you put that, and I also really appreciated uh, Alex's discussion of this when he brought it up. I thought he made a very insightful point, which was that he made the point that uh, even though sometimes you can make an inference from parts to wholes, you can do that sometimes. Like if the parts have mass, then the whole has mass. Still, that's not enough to sort of vindicate the argument from contingency if it's relying on this general inference uh, from parts to wholes. Because as long as you have one counterexample, like the one you gave, that's enough to show that that inference is not a reliable inference, the shaky inference. So the person giving the argument, they have the burden to justify the inferences. And all we need to, to do to undermine the, the argument um, is to point out that the inference is just not reliable in general. So I, I thought that was a nice way that Alex was was addressing. It. I thought that he identified one kind of response to the argument from contingency, which is just to give exam. Uh, sorry, one response to this fallacy of composition, which is just to give examples where it's it's not fallacious to make that inference. Um, but then that just leaves open the question, like, well, why isn't it fallacious in the particular case that's relevant to the argument from contingency? So the burden now is for the proponent of the argument from contingency to say more. Okay, so then now what more might we say? And so you, you, you know, are right that um, not all versions of the argument from contingency even move from parts to wholes. And in fact, none of the arguments that I ever give move from parts to wholes. Like not, not, no version that I ever give uses this inference from parts to wholes, but it might seem like it does because you remember I talked about how from dependent things, you can't compose an independent thing. And you might think, okay, well, that's making use of that inference from parts to wholes. But no, but it's not because there's another inference in at play. So this is where we have to like distinguish the inferences that are that are in play. So here's an inference. Inference, there's multiple inferences in play, but one of them is inference from extrapolation. So for example, we can extrapolate from many cases where we see an event have a cause, we can extrapolate, here's an explanation for why all those cases have a cause, because all events have a cause. Okay, that's extrapolation. That's not an inference from parts to wholes. 
Similarly, we can extrapolate when we consider many holes that have a cause. So for example, take the hole of all of the dirt uh, on Earth, like all that dirt together uh, has a cause, okay? So the parts have a cause and the hole has a cause. So by extrapolation, then we could explain why all dependent holes have causes by a basic principle that in general, from dependence, you can't get to independence, that all dependent totalities are themselves dependent. So here, the inference isn't really from part to whole, it's rather from extrapolation. And so that, that's one thing that you could say. I don't know if you want to follow up on that. I do, because extrapolation, I'm curious what is meant by that term. It sounds to me like you're basically just giving an inductive argument, which is sort of what I did with Alex. Yes. Because I talked about gravity and how yes. we experience gravity everywhere that we go, and so we can extrapolate, give an inductive argument for the fact that gravity works everywhere in the universe. And that seems like a really, really reasonable inference to make, right? Everywhere that we go, gravity works exactly the same. And we don't expect it to be different yes. anywhere in the universe, even though we have, I mean, everybody knows pretty much at this point how big the universe is. It's massive. Okay, it's, it's ridiculously huge. But it's so easy to see that this is a, a good inference, that from our experience, we walk around and, I mean, we don't even think about it because of how ubiquitous it is. It's everywhere. But it's a very, very reasonable inference to think that Gravity works everywhere where we go, so therefore, pretty reasonable, gravity works everywhere in the universe. Is that what, so I'm take, I take it that's what you meant, is that it's, it's, sort, of, it's a sort of inductive yes. argument for this. It, it, that's exactly what I'm saying. And, and I use extrapolation instead of induction only because induction is the philosopher's word, and I'm, I'm trying to learn how to speak more colloquially. <laughs> so it's, you know, why do we have to call it induction? I mean, the ordinary way of calling it, you know, is extrapolation. But yes, it's exactly what you're saying. Um, it's just, it, it, you're basically trying to figure out, another way of putting it is you're trying to figure out, okay, what's a hypothesis that best explains our observations? And so you consider competing hypotheses, you figure out, okay, which hypothesis best explains them? Well, presumably it's going to be the simplest hypothesis that accounts for all the data. So what's the simplest hypothesis that accounts for the data that we have with contingent things having expl an explanation. Well, here's one. Uh, in general, whatever is contingent exists only because of something else. Uh, some principle of explanation would account for the data. And it's a simple hypothesis. So yes. And, and, and notice that we're not relying on any general inference from parts to holes here. I mean, it maybe implies that whole whole contingent things like whole contingent solar systems for example have a cause as well right just like gravity works on parts that works on holes so too this principle of explanation works on parts and holes but the way that we justify the principle is not by this fallacy of composition but rather by this principle of induction or extrapolation Here's here's one thing that I, I've noticed you mention also in response to the fallacy of composition is that when it comes to explanation, individuals are not different from pluralities. There's no difference. And that's going back to the example that you gave, which what what actually was, so you talked about masses, right? So if a thing has mass, then the, the group of whatever it is has mass. So when it comes to mass, there's no difference. If it's a small thing, if it's a large thing, it everything has mass if... Part of it has mass. So in the same sense, when it comes to explanations, there's no difference between individuals yes. and pluralities of things. And you can give examples of this. Yes. It makes just as much sense to ask why one camera exists as it does to ask why 10 cameras exist. Yes. This is, it's not like less mysterious. Like imagine a camera appears in front of you and you're like, oh, that's mysterious. I should have had an explanation. But no, instead it was 10 cameras that appeared in front of you. And then you say, oh, that's mysterious. That should have an explanation. And then somebody says, no, 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 that's a fallacy of composition there. It's like, no, 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 it's not a fallacy of composition because it has nothing to do with it. It's just the principle of explanation applies to any number of things. Number is irrelevant. Yeah, here's, a, here's maybe another way to think about it is when we're talking about, I, I talked about elephants before. It's like every part of an elephant is light and weight. That doesn't mean the whole elephant is light and weight. However, if part of the elephant is gray, 
and the whole elephant, each part is gray, then the whole elephant is going to be gray. So when it comes to color, there's no difference between the parts and the holes. So that maybe that's another way to, to look at it. It's the same thing. So like color, there's no difference between parts and holes. And when it comes to explanation, there's obviously no difference between parts and holes there. Maybe that's not as clear to see in terms of an explanation. Yeah, well, and, and you can, one might wonder, okay, why are you saying that? And then one way you can answer it is through principle of induction. Another way you could answer it is, well, just sort of on reflection. It's just like, once you consider the cases, it just seems true. Like, just like it seems true that gray applies to the parts and to the whole, so does explanation. Yeah, you're walking down Times Square, okay, and you see one one cab drive by, and you're like, oh, well, that, that cab must have come from somewhere. There's some kind of explanation for it. And then 10 cabs drive by. You're not suddenly thinking, oh, well, they're just, they just all popped into being from, the, from around the corner, right? It, so it, it, it makes no difference between individuals yeah. and pluralities of things. I think that's a, a really good way of rebutting that. Well, yeah, well, I'm just going to say, I mean, there's even another path here that sidesteps the entire thing. This is less well known, but I, I just want to mention it because the, the issue of parts and holes can get kind of confusing, but we can sort of sidestep entirely by talking about types and asking why certain types are instantiated. Like, so for example, there's a type being an iPhone. And then you can ask, okay, why is that type? Um, wh why are there any iPhones? Like, why does anything instantiate that type? Why is there anything of that type? And here, parts and holes have nothing to do with it. It just has to do with why a certain type has any members at all. And so it makes sense when we think of examples that there's going to be an explanation. Like the type iPhone, you know, there's an explanation for why there are some iPhones. There are some types that don't exist yet. Like let's say Smurfs. Okay, that's a type, right? That type may never be instantiated. Like they'll never be Smurfs, okay? And why not? Well, there'll only be Smurfs if something explains why there are some Smurfs, maybe by creating a, a Smurf. And so when we think in terms of types, we can then think about the general type being contingent. And just as we need an explanation for why there are any iPhones or why there are any Smurfs or why there are any protons or why there are any cameras or why there are any people, in the same way, we need an explanation of, for, you know, for why there are any, any contingent things. And just as you can't say, well, here's why there are iPhones, because an iPhone made it the case that there are iPhones, that's circular. Then in the same way, we can't say that, well, here's why there are contingent things, because some contingent thing made it the case that there are contingent things, because in the same way that's circular. So if we want to avoid a circular explanation, now we're back to a non-contingent necessary foundation for contingent things. So that's, that's another path that moves from types and it has nothing to do with parts and holes at all. So we're really close to discussing the infinite regress problem. And there, I want to press you on the circular explanation, why that's unsatisfying or un maybe, maybe not unreasonable, but why it's not a good explanation, a circular explanation. So I'm going to shelf that for now because I think that's an important discussion to have. But here's, a, here's an objection that I saw actually from a professional philosopher. And this guy, I don't, I don't want to reveal his name, but he is probably one of the most brilliant Christian philosophers out there. Okay. He, I, I don't know that he accepts this argument, but this is sort of, and I'm going to paraphrase. So he's going to have to forgive me if I don't get this entirely correct, but basically he said that the PSR is something that your worldview determines for you. So if you're an atheist, for example, you won't be convinced that every contingent thing has an explanation. And if you're a theist, you will. And it, it seems like, so, so what he's saying is that you're only going to accept this conclusion or this this premise if you're already ex if you already accept it. So you're only going to accept it if you already accept it. And so basically, the, the question I have is: Can we only hope to convince people that already accept these premises, or do we have any hope of convincing people that might not view things the way that we do? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting because I, you know, I mentioned necessarybeing.com, and there I investigated this very question by asking people questions. And one of the questions I asked is whether they accept the conclusion of, well, stage one of the argument that there's a necessary thing. So theism takes us to stage two. But it was interesting because I think it was roughly half of the people who took the quiz during the trial period uh, said they didn't think that there was a necessary thing. They rejected 
that first stage its conclusion, but they did accept premises that logically entail that there, are, that there is a necessary being. And several people wrote, wrote me and said that it convinced them and it changed their mind. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, you know, I didn't believe in God. And then the argument from contingency led me to think first that there's a necessary foundation and then via stage two, that the foundation is supreme in its nature. I have friends who have a similar story who were moved by the argument they didn't first believe the conclusion. Now, I mean, as far as PSR, PSR is not even necessary for every pathway. So there are atheists who believe in PSR, but who reject theism. And there are, uh, I remember when I rejected PSR, I rejected the principle of sufficient reason. And this was after I was moved by a two-stage argument from contingency. Yeah, I didn't accept PSR. I was stuck on some of the puzzles against it. And it was only later that I became less skeptical and then worked myself through those puzzles. But, but it had nothing to do with theism. So, I mean, I guess I would say it's just more complicated. I mean, I, I do think that, that, yeah, I mean, probably if you're a theist, you're more likely to think that something like PSR is true. I mean, especially because PSR is a handy tool in arguments for theism. <laughs> and so if, if, you know, it can actually lead you to be a theist. But I wouldn't say it's because of the theism. It wasn't because of the theism in my case. So this is really more a question about psychology, what people would do yeah. and that kind of thing, which is, these are all very interesting questions. We've actually had a discussion twice here on this podcast about that. But ultimately, when it comes to the argument, like that is not an objection to any premise of the argument, to any argument of the, in defense of one of the premises. So I, I think that while that's an interesting thing to think about, ultimately, if we do want to figure out whether or not this argument is true, going back to objections as tests, yes. then we need to actually look at the objections to the the arguments that we're giving in defense of it. And ultimately, that that can be our way to help us determine whether or not we think that this argument is good and sound. Yes. So I think that we'd have to turn back to that. And on that note, let's turn to another objection. We have two left. And then we'll, we're going to end this episode and, uh, and shift over to, to stage two. So this one comes from Quantum Mechanics. You already mentioned this earlier. These are some of the objections that you hear from students every now and then. Yes. You don't just hear it from students. But basically, some people argue, and I don't know what all this stuff means, virtual particles can come into being from nothing, or at least there's no cause or reason that they come into being. They just kind of pop into existence randomly. And this is a scientific example. It's a sort of counterexample of, of a contingent thing that has no explanation. And I think the, one of the reasons why this is so powerful or it's seen as so powerful is because we have this scientific counterexample. And when science starts to get introduced and stuff, it has, I don't know, it has this psychological effect, I think, on, on people. It's like you have... You know, it's philosophy versus science, and science is obviously going to win. It's it's more powerful. So I think this is maybe it's not the most strongest objection. Maybe it's not the strongest objection to the to the argument from contingency, but maybe it's one of the more moving ones. Yeah. And so that's what that's the reason why we should we should spend some time on it. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. I was actually at a philosophy conference, and I was talking with somebody. Um, just sort of on the side, we were just talking and, and I was talking about an argument from contingency and they brought up this objection to me, a philosopher. Uh, I think he said that he taught logic and this was sort of his stumbling block to the argument. And it was very interesting because I just asked him, you know, well, what do you think about thinking of causes as probabilistic? So instead of causes having to determine the outcome you know, as you said, determinism, where there's sort of only one path without any choices, that instead causes just to make probable their effect. And he he objected to that. He said that, like, sort of by definition, the word cause um, just means it determines its effect. And so the idea here is that, well, these small particles, virtual particles, nothing really determines them from the prior states. And so therefore, they they count as uncaused on his definition of cause. But then it was interesting because, you know, we were in rapport. I mean, this is an example of a productive conversation where we were just having fun and 
we were seeking to learn from each other. And so instead of me sort of digging in to the ground and saying, well, you know, your definition of cause is wrong or whatever, I just granted that. And I said, okay, well, if that's how you use the term cause, that's fine. What do you think instead of using the word condition? And then I just gave the whole argument again in terms of condition. And I said, I mean, look, when things exist, and I use the problem of chaos that we talked about earlier, um, that there isn't this chaos. And what explains that? Well, what explains it is that at least when things happen, there's some prior conditions that allow them to happen. It was very interesting because that helped. I mean, he said, okay, that, that seems plausible, you know, and so let's see, you know, where the argument goes from there. And that's how we got past that objection. And so ever since then, I've found it very helpful to just make this distinction between a cause that determines its effect without any other possibility versus a cause that makes, that, that doesn't determine of necessity its effect, but that acts as a prior condition for its effect, that makes its effect possible. And whether you call that cause or not, that's just a verbal issue. The point is, is that we need some condition there that allows the effect to happen. So that's what I would say. I like how you used verbal instead of semantic. I don't know if you were itching to use the term semantic there. <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from the philosopher's jargon here. Yeah. No, it's good. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention on this on this one was this actually was what sparked me to use the gumball machine analogy because you use this. You sent me so graciously one of the one of the pre-drafts, the initial drafts of your book that you're working on which I want to make sure that we, we talk about at the end. One of the things that you mentioned in response to this objection was to talk about a gumball machine analogy. And I'm actually, I, I want to hear how you explain that because it was, it was really helpful and insightful. And I think it will help put some, some meat on the, on the bones of the, because we're, we're thinking really abstractly here, causes versus conditions. But if we get an illustration with some gumballs, I think it'll, I think it'll help us solidify it. Yeah. And I'm trying to get the, the trying to remember it clearly. You you might have okay better understanding of this now, better clear memory. Let, let's see. It's basically imagine you have a gumball machine, and it's got some red balls and blue balls inside. Okay, I'll say you put a quarter in, and it's sort of indeterminate whether you're going to get a red ball or a blue ball. It could go either way. Um, so the quarter is like the cause. And then the effect is, let's say you just happen to get a blue gumball. So the blue gumball didn't come from nothing, okay? Like it came from a prior state. And that prior state of it sort of coming into your hand, we could say it was initiated by you putting the coin into the gumball machine. So there's still a cause and there's still an effect, even though the effect was, you might say, indeterministic that you get that color. Whereas in another case, you can imagine the gumball machine has only blue gumballs. So when you put the coin in, there's only one outcome, namely you get a blue gumball. At least there's one outcome in terms of what color you get. I guess it would be still perhaps indeterminate, like which gumball you get. So this is a way of illustrating the difference between deterministic effects versus indeterministic effects. In both cases, there's a cause, like the coin goes in. But in the one case, it's sort of indeterministic which color you get. But in the other case, it's deterministic. And the way that relates to the virtual particles is that you might think that what's going on there is that the virtual particles are not deterministic effects. They're indeterministic effects from prior condition, but they don't come from nothing. They still require prior states. Yeah. I think that for this objection to work, the quantum mechanics objection to work, we'd have to imagine that instead of a gumball machine, a blue gumball or a red gumball would just sort of magically pop in our hands. That's the only way that this objection goes through. If there's, there'd have to be no gumball machine at all, a gumball would just have to pop in your hand. And that's, obviously we're talking about this, in like right. replace the gumball with a virtual particle. That's the difference, is that the virtual particle yes. would just have to pop into being for no reason, without any explanation. But that's not what's really going on when we're talking about quantum mechanics. Yeah. We have some kind of quantum vacuum that a virtual particle is coming into being from. So there are these prior conditions. You talked about that before. We have these prior conditions that are sort of setting the scene for what's about to happen. And going back to the gumball machine, we have this gumball filled with red and blue balls. And when you turn the lever, 
you're going to get one of those. And that's the explanation, even though it might be indeterminate and it might not be 100% certain that you're going to get either one, you're still, you still have this whole scheme, this whole situation where you've got the gumball machine, you turn the lever, you get something out. So it's not the fa- it's not a matter of like holding your hand open and a blue ball just popping in your hand. Right. That's not what's going on when we when we're talking about quantum mechanics. There's a whole situation, there's a whole reality beyond the virtual particle itself that's involved in in the explanation even though we might not have a determined causal relation here. I don't know. I I think I hope people are able to track on this because it, it yeah. does start to get a- well and, and that's that's the credible scientific account but let me also just add there's we have good reason to think that virtual particles don't literally come from nothing without any prior conditions apart from the science we have good reason because the difference in size is not relevant to the ability to be uncaused i mean it's not like if you take a like a pink ball and you just like make it bigger or something then it's more likely, like, I, I guess, imagine a pink ball that doesn't exist and like make it bigger in your own mind. It's not like its size is going to make it like easier to come into being if it's bigger or smaller. And then there's a probability problem because there's literally infinitely many different kinds of small things. And if any one of them could just come to be from nothing uncaused, then it's just vanishingly, vanishingly unlikely that this just never happens. So. So yeah, so there's there's the irrelevance of size, which um, together with the problem of chaos again, that that gives us a positive reason. This isn't just like a defensive move that, oh, well, for all we know, virtual particles could still be caused indeterministically. No, no, like we have good reason to think that they don't just come from nothing like everything else. So let's talk about the infinite regress problem a little bit more, and we'll talk about why circular explanations are, are bad explanations. So why can't groups of things explain themselves? This is the objection. Take a stack of portable hard drives, because I'm a photographer. If we have an explanation for each hard drive, then why do we need some kind of additional explanation for the group of hard drives if each individual thing is explained? Isn't the group of hard drives explained simply by listing the manufacturer of each hard drive? And this sort of shows that we don't need a necessary being to explain the plurality of all contingent things because each contingent thing is explained by some other contingent thing and this just goes on forever all the way down. Yeah, so I think what we need to do is separate some cases. So on one level, I want to say yes, like we can explain the group by explaining each of the parts. In fact, you could say that the explanations of the parts add up to a total explanation of the group. But notice that in the example that you gave where you had the manufacturer, the total explanation exists outside of the total explanandum, which is the thing, the things to be explained. So the manufacturer is not itself among the hard drives, right? It's, it transcends the hard drives, you could say. So all the individual explanations could add up to a complete explanation as long as the individual explanations transcend the effect. That avoids circularity. But think now about a different case. So imagine, uh, well, let's just take the case of the infinite stack of turtles, okay? Turtles all the way down. So you want to know, okay, so why is there this top turtle? And that's because there's a turtle underneath it that caused it. And that exists because of a turtle underneath that that caused it. And then it goes all the way down. And then you say, okay, well, can't the explanations of the parts add up to an explanation of the whole? Well, here the problem is that the explanation of the parts is included in the whole. I mean, it's part of the very effect because this is sort of the the nature of infinity here is that because there's nothing outside the chain. Now, if there is something outside the chain explaining each part, then that's a different case. That would be like maybe each of the infinitely many turtles is produced by something else, right? Something that is in the turtle. Then the cause would transcend the effect. But if it's just the turtles explaining the turtles, then we have a circular explanation. And that's a problematic kind of explanation. It doesn't really answer why there are those turtles in the first place. Does that help? I mean, there's so much more we could say. I mean, 
sometimes people, they respond by pressing that, well, no, I mean, in this case, the totality of the turtles is explained by the parts of that totality. And sometimes we, the parts do explain the whole. And then my response to that is, well, let's make a distinction between the totality and the plurality. Okay, now this is getting technical, but maybe the totality is a whole, and maybe it is explained by its parts, the turtles. So let's let the, the plurality now refer to the, just the turtles. So the plurality of the turtles explains the totality of the turtles. But now we can ask, okay, but what explains the plurality of the turtles? And now if you just say the answer is those same turtles, well, that's a plurality explaining the plurality, and that's flatly circular. I think if we go back to what you said earlier about the types, maybe that would be helpful too. Yes, I was just thinking that. that I think it is useful at this point if somebody's still stuck and saying, well, you know, what is this distinction between totality and plurality? Haven't we explained everything there is to be explained? Each turtle is explained, right? This is sort of the Humean idea. Each one is explained. What else is there to explain? You say the turtles. Maybe there just is no explanation of the turtles. Uh, it's not that it's explained by itself, that's circular. There just is no explanation, and there shouldn't even need to be one, because everything in the series is explained. And I think, yes, talking about types is, is perhaps just a helpful way of pressing like why there would still need to be an explanation. Here, here's a way of thinking about it. Imagine that in front of your eyes right now, a blue box appeared, okay? and Suppose it just happens to be that the top half of this blue box is caused by the bottom half of the blue box. It's, it's a weird situation, okay? And then the bottom half of the blue box, well, it's, it divides into its own top half and bottom half. And as you might guess, its top half is caused by its bottom half, and then its bottom half further divides into top half and bottom half. And we continue this division ad infinitum. There's an actual infinite series of causes that has appeared in front of you, like from nothing, okay? That would still be puzzling. Just the fact, just because there's an infinite series of causes does nothing to explain why there is that series. And we could perhaps express this puzzle in terms of the general type being a box in this room, let's say. So we specify the type to this room. We haven't explained why that type is instantiated by anything in the first place. You can't appeal to its parts to explain why that general type is instantiated in the first place. That's still left unexplained. And I think that's pretty intuitive. I mean, it's, it would be puzzling if a box appeared and merely dividing the box into an infinite regress does nothing to answer why that box exists at all. And similarly, for any given type, we have an explanation for why that type has members. We don't have counter examples to that. And I would say the simplest and best explanation of this observation is that in general, all contingent types are going to be explained. In fact, I would even just say all types are going to have an explanation, either in terms of some prior causes or in terms of the necessity of its instantiation. Well, we're already going on. We've gone on an hour and a half on stage one. and We could, we could even break down each. We were actually talking about this before we went on air that we could break down each one of these objections and talk about it for a couple hours, probably each one. So unfortunately, we don't have time to do all that. And we don't even have time really to defend the, the various pathways that we set out at the beginning. But what's really nice is that Josh has actually created videos pretty much on every single one of these objections and even in defense of the pathways that he's outlined. So what I'll do is I'll provide links to all of those if you want to look deeper into these objections. And then from here, why don't we just go ahead and close out stage one of the argument. Again, I just want to remind people, stage one is not where atheists or people who are not already Christians, not already theists, this is not necessarily where you have to jump off the argument because really where the, the hardest work, in my opinion, is stage two we're arguing that there is a necessary part of reality that is God, that is not just the universe, but has these sort of divine properties. And I think that's really where atheists need to be suspect about, obviously, because you can't be an atheist and endorse that the necessary part of reality has omniscience and is omnibenevolent, all that stuff. So I think that's where atheists should be more concerned about is, is stage two. So just to remind people, Stage one is not necessarily where you've got to be 
more skeptical in in that sense. Did you have any any last things to add about stage one before we close this this episode out? Yeah, probably just just a very quick sort of summary picture. So imagine a castle which represents the totality of everything. Castle represents reality. And then what stage one is is really doing is it's it's trying to identify a floor of the castle as providing an ultimate account of how there could even be a castle. So the floor is like the ground layer. It's what we might call the foundation. And the foundation exists in a way that's different from the dependent parts of the castle, the, the dependent parts of things. The foundation exists independently and necessarily. And if you're an atheist, you could think of this as the sort of fundamental energy, maybe, or just the universe itself, right? But there, the idea is there needs to be this special category of thing, a necessary thing, an independent thing that provides the ground layer for everything else. So I think that's a good summary uh, statement to give you a picture of what what this stage accomplishes. Well, thanks, Josh, for laying that out, giving the summary, and then also everything that we've already discussed in episode uh, in this part one of the, the this two episode series. So thanks again for coming on. And hey, guys, just stay tuned. We're about to to jump into the next episode where we'll be discussing stage two of the argument, which just to remind you very quickly is that we have this necessary part of reality and that necessary part of reality is God. And that is what you're going to be looking out for in stage two. So stay tuned and we'll see you guys soon. Welcome back to stage two of the argument from contingency. I'm here with my very good friend, Josh Rasmussen. We're finishing off this episode or this series on the contingency argument, which is, as many of you guys know, my favorite argument for God's existence. Maybe let's talk about that for a second. Is this one of your favorites, Josh? Yeah, I find it very intriguing. And I think because more than even just as an argument for theism, it invites me to just think about the ultimate questions. Uh, I mean, from any perspective, it it takes us to the foundation of everything, foundation of all existence, of all inquiries. Uh, in my recent book, as I was unpacking the relationship between the foundation and everything else, I was just struck by its connection literally to everything, like math, logic, consciousness, reasoning. It all, this argument sort of brings it all together. So I would say, yes, it's, it, it, it's probably just my favorite arguments, my most most intriguing argument for me. Well, this is a species of argument, the cosmological arguments. And to compare it to just briefly, the Kalam cosmological argument, that one is talking about the beginning of the universe. And usually with that argument, we've got to get into physics and we've got to get into cosmology. And those, I think, take a lot of study. And there's actually, well, I don't even want to speak on it. I know that a lot of cosmologists are thinking that, yeah, it's probably the case that the universe began to exist. But even at that, you've got to get into a lot of literature and you've got to figure out what really is going on there. And with the argument from contingency, you don't necessarily have to go down that route. You can actually at some point, if you wanted to talk about why the universe can't be a necessary being because it began to exist. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. I I think that you don't necessarily have to go there. And so it, it might just in one sense be, be better at that be better that way. But another thing that it has going for it, and this is actually a perfect segue into stage two, is that we can actually start to discuss how we can get at the existence of God, full-fledged classical theistic picture of God, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. We can get to this classical picture of God through, I think, the contingency argument alone. And with the Kalam we're going to be pretty limited in what we can infer based on that argument alone. So I, I think that this has a lot of application. It's really interesting. And so just to remind people, folks that are listening, what is the difference between stage one and stage two of this argument? Right. So in the first stage, we're focused on seeing why there would be an ultimate foundation for contingent things. This foundation would have a necessary nature and provide a kind of ultimate explanation for why there are things that themselves don't have a necessary nature. These are things that are contingent, they can fail to be. That would be st- 
stage one, and then stage two seeks to identify the nature of this necessary foundation and unpack the theistic attributes, such as um, having supreme power, supreme knowledge, and, and supreme goodness. So you talked about some of those terms already, but let's discuss what other terms we need to know for stage two. In stage one, we talked about contingency, necessity. We even talked about dependence. What are some of the terms that we need for stage two? Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, I guess, just as there are different versions of stage one, there are different versions of stage two. And so the terminology is going, it's going to depend on sort of the particular line that you're going to take. My favorite line requires that I define the term supreme or perfect. And I've thought about whether I could sort of sidestep that by talking instead about maximal power and then deriving from maximal power other theistic attributes. But although there are these other lines to explore, in the end, my favorite route takes us to a supreme foundation. So I would say the key term for me would be to define what do I mean by supreme? And to be honest, I heard you give a definition of perfect, which is what I'm thinking of now in terms of supreme. In your exchange with Alex, you said it's that which cannot be improved upon. And I thought that was a nice pithy way of putting it. Um, another way that I like to characterize this is just through an example where I'm praising my wife, Rachel, and I'm just telling her the things I like about her. I'm saying, you're so great. You are powerful. You have knowledge. You have virtue. Uh, and, and all these things I'm saying sort of intuitively make sense of what I would say if I'm praising her. But if I said something like, you are virtuous, you are uh, weak. It's like, well, that thing, calling her weak, that's sort of incompatible with praising her. And we understand intuitively, it's not like a great making feature. And so power, knowledge, wisdom, kindness, these things are all pointing toward a more, uh, a more fundamental attribute um, of greatness. And if you take greatness to its limits, then you get supreme greatness or perfection. So you talked about a couple different methods that people use in stage two. And in my research, I've discovered two primary methods or ways that stage two is defended. The first one is to introduce additional evidence. This is something that I saw in Alexander Proust's argument that he has in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. So in addition to contingent things, we'd add evidence from fine tuning, moral knowledge, and so on. And this is also Richard Swinburne's approach. He likes the accumulative case. So once we add all the evidence together, it's clear that this necessary part of reality must be God. When we're talking about fine tuning, that's a design argument. So basically, whoever created the universe, whoever put it together had to be a designer. And so that would imply, therefore, that the necessary part of reality is also a designer and only being or only agents, personal beings can can design things, basically. So this is what I'll call the cumulative approach. And the second method I've found is to analyze the necessary foundation. I think this is the approach that you favor, actually. So the question there would be, does this being have any power? And if so, how much? Obviously, it has to if it's the explanation of right. contingent things. It's got to have some kind of power, right? Can it create five universes, maybe 20? Does it have any knowledge? That's another question. Does it understand right and wrong? And so I'll call this approach the analytic approach. And so let's get some of your comments on these, these two methods. Yeah, I like the way that you put that. One way we could distinguish them is by arguments from effect versus arguments from the nature of the cause. And I actually find both, both to be quite valuable. In fact, in my recent book that I'm, I'm polishing off now, um, I take both approaches. So I talk about the kinds of effects that we see in the world, such as consciousness, morality, reasoning. And then I work my way from those effects to the kind of cause that could be an ultimate cause of them. And that actually can illuminate the nature of the foundation in significant ways. But yes, and there's also the argument from just the nature of the cause. And we just take an analytic approach, we apply reason, and we just think about, okay, what kind of a foundation could have this necessary existence? What kind of a foundation could be ultimate? And then we can begin to unpack 
some of its features through that analytic approach. Did you want me to go into a little bit of you know how how we could do that, how we could actually proceed, or you want, or would you rather address something else first? Yeah, before we get into the different approaches and everything, I want to go back to something we discussed in part one of this series, which were barriers to belief. We made a distinction between objections and barriers. And just as a reminder, objections are a way to test a hypothesis, whereas barriers are obstacles that keep someone from taking an argument seriously. And it seems to me that part two of the arguments, or stage two of the argument, sorry, is where we're going to see a lot of barriers or potentially we're going to see a lot of barriers. And so just remind us what those are, what the, the types of barriers that we're going to see here are, and how we can all learn to remove them, start to remove these. I would say the most significant barrier that I see here is just the association of the conclusion, theism, with other things, like religion in particular. And in fact, I noticed this. It was very interesting in your exchange with Alex. You made this argument from simplicity. And his quick response was to, he seemed surprised that you could think that theism provided a simpler account of the foundation. And so he mentioned a bunch of things from religion about the nature of God that adds complexity. And I think what might be going on there is that if we think about this argument through the lens of religion, then we're going to end up associating a lot of complexity particulars um, and objections that we might have to religion. I mean, including even objections to maybe uh, intellectual vices that we associate with religion, a kind of dogmatism, a lack of genuine truth seeking. And so it's going to put a barrier in the way of really taking seriously this argument from the standpoint, not of religion, but just through reason. Um, and I think one way to remove that barrier is just to make this distinction, really to flag the problem that this conclusion is often associated with various religions, but we're, we don't have to think about this at all from a religious lens. We can just look at this as people, as philosophers, as truth seekers who want to understand the nature of the foundation. And we can ask, okay, well, what is the best account of the nature of the foundation? Let's get out our instruments, get out our tools of reasoning and and evidence, and let's just have a look. Um, and I think that goes a long way to removing the barrier, just to separate kind of what we're doing. And then also one more thing is to just emphasize that the goal is a greater understanding, it's clarity. And I think oftentimes people will resist an argument if they feel like the argument's being used not to help bring clarity, but rather to right, like to win an argument or to um, prove something that one antecedently already believes, not through reason or evidence, but through some other means. And so then it's like hard to trust, uh, right, like the person who's maybe defending the argument. We, it's not really, it's like what you said before about psychology. It's not about a psychology, a battle of psychology. It's about really trying to find out what's true through the instruments of reason and evidence. So before we get into the supreme being hypothesis, which is your preferred method, I wanted to discuss just briefly some of the different attributes. So in your work, you have two different papers on the contingency argument. One of them is from states of affairs to a necessary being, and then the second one is from a necessary being to God. I believe, I believe that's the, the, those are the titles of those two papers. Am I wrong? I have those papers. I also have a new argument for necessary being. So I have a couple on the, the stage one. And then, yes, there's one on stage two from a necessary being to God. That's right. So, yeah, from a necessary being to God, in that one, what you do is you sort of go through and you first establish infinite power that the necessary being has to have infinite power. And then from there, you move on and you sort of establish the other divine attributes. So before we get to your preferred hypothesis or your preferred approach. I wanted to discuss some of these properties because this is actually what I do on my website. I have a an article that most of my listeners will be aware of. It's called an updated contingency argument, which is largely based on your work, Josh. And one of the first things that I do as well is to establish infinite power, that the necessary part of reality mm -hmm. has to have infinite power. And at this point, this is also something that I think 
people may not understand is that it, it before we get to stage two, I mean, we could have a plurality of necessary beings that are the explanation of, mm-hmm. of everything. So before we even get to unity, that there's only one being, then we can talk about infinite power. Like this group of things, if it's, if it is a group or if it's an individual necessary being, let's talk about some of the arguments that you have, or I can, I, I mean, I can even give one off of my website for, for infinite power. And then maybe a couple of the other attributes. Uh, well, if you wanted to list, uh, mention your argument, and then I can add to that. Okay. Uh, let me actually mention two here. So the, the first one is basically that when we're thinking about possible worlds, what this necessary being could create, it has to have some kind of power if it's going to be the explanation of contingent things. And think about it like this. So I have a stapler here. I have to have some kind of power if I'm going to be able to create this stapler, right? But let's think about this. So it takes a certain amount of power to create one stapler, and it takes more power to create two staplers. But then let's imagine, well, how many staplers actually could exist? And it seems like we could always add more staplers to the mix. We could always think of more possible worlds where we have more and more and more and more staplers. And so basically what we'd have to say at that point is that there, this necessary being that explains all the contingent staplers that could possibly exist this necessary thing has to be unlimited in power because there's always one more stapler that you could add. And so this is one way that we could see that this necessary part of reality has to be unlimited in power because there's always one more thing that, that could be created. That, that's one way. Another, thing, uh, another way that Richard Swinburne prefers, or at least he, he mentions in his work, is that a finite limitation of power, if we're thinking that, well, maybe the necessary foundation has some kind of finite limit in what it can create. Maybe it can only create 20 universes. For example, there's a question here about why 20 universes, why can it only create that number, that that finite number? And so, for instance, if the necessary thing exhibited, say, 1,000 units of power, one might wonder why it doesn't have 1,001 units of power, or why not one unit of power? And so this is another one of those things that sort of cries out for explanation, just like a contingent thing cries out for an explanation. Some sometimes properties of a thing, specific properties of a thing cry out for explanation. So there's a, well, this stapler on my desk, going back to the stapler, this is black, the stapler that I'm looking at. So this is, this is a question that, that we want to know. Why is it black instead of red or green or blue? And that's a question, that's a very, very legitimate question that we can ask. And so in the same way, we'd want to ask, well, this is a finite limit. So why that limit instead of some other limit? And there's got to be some explanation for that. So these two combined, I think, are, are really good arguments for thinking that the necessary foundation has infinite power. What are your thoughts there? And then maybe if you want to expand on those. Yeah, that's a good summary. And I think all I would add is just, you know, the, the arguments you gave are related by a problem with thinking that there's some arbitrary cutoff, either to like the number of staplers that could be produced or just to the power that it has. It's like, you know, why we're talking about logical possibility here. This is the foundation of all contingent things. It has necessary existence. And so whatever is possible, it's the ultimate foundation of that, right? So why would there be some cutoff any, for any finite number? We say, well, you know, once you get up to a universe with, I don't know, 10 to the 99 staplers, that's it. You can't make one more. Like there's no other possible universe in which there's even one more stapler. That that seems like an arbitrary cutoff. And the simplest account of the nature of the power is that it's just infinite. Well, or zero. It has to have at least some power to produce it right to be the foundation of the effect. But if instead you say it has a finite amount of power, then you do have this problem of an arbitrary cutoff. And that seems problematic. From here, I I want to turn turn it back over to you. Where do you go after you establish infinite power? Do you go to volition? Do you try to establish that this is a personal being? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because in the article that you mentioned, so I I wrote that actually quite a few years ago. I was in graduate school and I was teasing these properties out one by one. So I had this argument for infinite power and then I had an argument for volition and it had to do with the connection between the necessary thing and the contingent effects. Or one version of it is that it couldn't have produced the effects 
just by its necessary nature or else the effects would be necessary. And it also couldn't just fix a probability of its effects because the probability, for any probability, it would be arbitrary why it was that probability rather than a slightly different one. And so if it's not by its nature and it's not by some probability, then the only other accounts seem to be that it would be by volition, or at least the only plausible alternative. And so this is how I then argued for its volition. And then from there, I argued that, well, in order for it to have volition and power, it's the kind of thing that would be personal, because only persons have volition. And in order for it to be personal and be able to produce a universe, it would have to have at least some knowledge. And then I argued from arbitrary limits again, that in order for it to have knowledge, it's not going to have some arbitrary limit, limit in its knowledge. It's either going to be zero, but that contradicts the fact that it's personal, so it's able to produce this world with beings that have knowledge. So it's got to be infinite or maximal. And then I turned toward goodness, and I had sort of a similar argument. So I, I, argue, I argued property by property. But I just want to say I've, I've shifted it in my approach. I, I think I have a more powerful way of proceeding now, one that gets underneath all the property. But I, I don't know if you want to comment at all at my summary of those arguments. I'm, I'm sort of thinking it through because I, I think that it is important to, to look at it these two ways, because there are these two yeah. methods, right? The, the first method was to add additional evidence. The second one is to analyze the necessary foundation. And I think there are two, there are two different ways that you could analyze it. Yes. And the first, the first way would be to, and I, so we're talking about method two here, which is the analytic approach I mentioned. Yeah. And there's really two ways that you could do the analytic approach. One of them is to use sort of deduction, give some arguments for the individual properties. But another way is to use the way that you use or your preferred approach now, which is to, to, and it's actually the one that I used in my debate with Alex. And I use that because I figured that if you were, if you were favoring that one now, there's got to be some good reason behind it. And so actually that's, that's sort of the reason that I preferred that one. And I think it's actually easier to, to sort of comprehend in a debate type situation. Yeah. So actually I, I want to make a clarification. So I, there's another approach here. So the preferred approach that I have, there's a deductive form of it. So what you're talking about is um, using a uh, kind of a probabilistic approach where you're making an appeal to the best explanation. And so you're going to appeal to simplicity. And that's the approach that I took with Graham. And that's also the approach you took with Alex. And I think that's a very helpful approach, especially in a conversation, because we can just be looking at hypotheses and then considering pluses and minuses of the different hypotheses. But even before we look at that approach, I want to suggest another deductive approach that doesn't go property by property, but rather moves from the necessary foundation to its most fundamental property and then derives all the other properties from there. Would you like me to unpack that? Because I would say my favorite approach is deductive, an approach from which you can actually see with crystal clarity every step. And you can actually know that the foundation is supreme and has the theistic attributes. You can know that in principle. Yes. Let's, let's uh, go ahead and turn to that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, disclaimer, you know, speaking of barriers, you know, one, one of the ways we can create a barrier is by sort of being overly confident and claiming that you can know things that, you know, like people say, well, I can't see how you can know that. So I don't really trust you. Okay. So having said that, I would be intellectually dishonest if I told you that I don't think that we can actually know that the foundation is supreme through this kind of an argument. And the reason that I would be dishonest is because um, I think that I've come to know the foundation is supreme, and that's just how it seems to me. So having said that, just because I think I see a path, but let me put it this way. Whatever you can know, it's possible for somebody to be blocked from seeing that. And there's nothing wrong with that. There can be a rational obstacle to that. Like, for example, there was a time when I had a different view about the nature of consciousness than I have now. I don't think I was irrational. It's just I didn't see the things that I see now. Okay, so okay, so those disclaimers out of the way. Here's the outline of the path. Basically, we move from a necessary foundation to sort of the ultimate explanation for its necessity. Okay, so like what makes the foundation 
necessary. Now, it's very interesting, actually. There's a recent article came out in 2018, June. And it's called From a Necessary Being to a Perfect Being. And this is from Ryan. This is by Ryan Byerly. And um, he makes an argument that the best explanation of a necessary being is going to be in terms of perfection, a perfect nature. And the reason that he, he says this is because if you think about it, like what kind of a being would be perfect? Just think about this conceptually. Like imagine, you know, you're attributing worth to a being. It's a being that cannot be improved upon. So you think about well, what kind of a being would it be? Would it be the kind of being that could fall apart? Is it the kind of being that could fail to exist? Well, no, it seems like a truly maximally great being, a perfect being that cannot be improved upon, would have the greatest kind of existence. And that would be the kind of existence that cannot fail to be. It would have necessary existence. So here, now this isn't the deductive argument. This is just setting the stage for why you might think that a perfect foundation or supreme foundation provides the best account of a, uh, of a necessary foundation. The deductive version of this proceeds like this. Suppose that the foundation is less than perfect. Suppose it has some degree of, of greatness that's, that's between zero and right, the limit case of perfection. Well, then we have the problem of arbitrary limits. This is the same problem that led us to think that it had to have maximal power. It's just instead of arguing for maximal power and then arguing for maximal knowledge, let's just argue straight away for its maximal value, for its supreme nature. If it had less than a supreme nature, then it would have some cutoff, some limit. And if it has some limit, then there has to be some deeper explanation to account for why it has that limit. And we can argue for this based on the principle of explanation we used even in the first stage, uh, well, one version of the principle, which would apply to things that are contingent. Contingent things have an explanation. Well, any limit is going to be contingent. It's, it's going to call for a deeper explanation that accounts for why it has that limit right there. But the problem is the foundation of everything there's no deep explanation behind the foundation of everything. It's the ultimate explanation. So by definition of its foundationalness, of its ultimacy, uh, there can't be an explanation of its degree of perfection. So therefore, if its degree of perfection or greatness is limited, then that leads to a contradiction because that implies that there's a deeper explanation, but there can't be a deeper explanation. So therefore, it can't be limited. It can only be perfect. Okay, questions, clarifications? Yes, lots. Okay, so we have this perfect being, and we're saying that, I'm, I'm trying to think about how the, the best way to word this. So we have this necessary being, and we're imagining, well, let's, let's assume that this being is less than perfect, and so it has some kind of limit in maybe what it can do, maybe what it knows, maybe how good it is. But what about this? So... Let's assume that it's infinite in power, but then it has zero knowledge. Yes. Does that cry out for an explanation? Because that's not a finite limit. That's just to say that it has zero. Does that, do you think that that's the same kind of situation of the arbitrary limits? Yeah, so it wouldn't... So in that case, I don't think we would need to have an explanation for it's having knowledge, because we could just say it just has zero knowledge. And that sounds pretty much as good as saying it's just simply infinite knowledge or maximal knowledge. But the problem there, though, is that it wouldn't be supreme in its, in its nature. So it wouldn't have a limit to knowledge, but it would still have a limit to its, we might say, its value or its degree of supremacy or its degree of greatness. These are all different ways of getting at the same concept that I'm trying to point to. I think value is, is a good term for it. It has some value by virtue of its valuable properties, such as the property of having the ability to like withstand all forces, right? Like it can't fall apart. It can't cease to be as necessary existence. It has supreme knowledge, let's say, by the argument that we gave, that the couple arguments that you gave. And so it's got some value. But then how much value does it have? And if we say it has zero knowledge, well, then its value, there's some arbitrary cutoff. 
why does it have value? The amount of value that allows it to have supreme power and necessary existence, but it's just cut off there. That's still a limit. And I think then that limit would call out for further explanation, especially because we can think of a, something that has more value than that. Yeah, I, I'm definitely catching where you're where you're going with this. So at this point, I'm I'm doing my best to to play devil's advocate here. Let's let's think about why we have to have an explanation for arbitrary limits. Right. So I mean, there's a few different approaches. I mean, we could appeal if you know if we're in a kind of modest uh, mode, we can appeal to just this inference to the best explanation. So in general limited things have an explanation and the simplest best explanation of our observations of limited things having an explanation is that that they all do right <laughs> um, another argument more from reason is just that limits just by their very nature mark a cutoff between the actual and the potential so for example if there's a limited amount of i don't know water then that marks a boundary between sort of the actual water and some conceivable potential water. And if that's right, well, then one reason, then to, another reason to think that limits would have to have a further explanation is to explain why things are actual to the degree that they are. It's about actualizing possibilities, like because there could always be more. Well, why isn't the more actual? Why is this actual rather than the more. And it seems like we need a deeper explanation for that. So we're appealing again to sort of this general principle that contingent things, contingent states don't just exist. And, and even if, if people are skeptical about the general principle, they think maybe there are exceptions. I know there are some puzzles against the general principle. Still, there's the presumption that contingent things have an explanation other things being equal. So unless we have an independent reason to think that the contingent limit in question doesn't have an explanation, the presumption would be to think that it does have an explanation. And again, anything less than perfect is going to be limited and there can be no, no explanation of its limit. And so it seems like that would be a problem. Other things being equal, we should prefer to think that there's an explanation. Okay. I'm th still thinking through this argument because it's, it's fascinating to me right now. Could we use a kind of modal principle of sufficient reason in order to defend this? So we're asking, well, like, why does this thing, assuming that it has like zero knowledge, it's less than perfectly valuable. And so we want to ask, well, it has a finite limit in how valuable it is. So what best explains this or what's the, what's the explanation? And according to, if we, if we adopt some kind of principle of explanation, then we'd have to have some kind of explanation for, for why this finite limit is being exemplified as opposed to infinite value or, or, or what, what have you. So could we use a kind of modal principle of explanation that, again, introduces this modal operator possibly? Possibly there's an explanation for yeah. this. Possibility. Could we use yeah. Is that enough? Like, could we, could we, because that's a more modest version. We talked about that in, in part one. Yeah, so that shows up in the article you mentioned from Necessary Being to God. Uh, it also shows up in a co-author with Chris Weaver in the book, The Two Dozen or So Arguments for God. Uh, we develop a modal version as well, where, yeah, all we need is the possibility of a deeper explanation. Again, because there can't be, it's impossible <laughs> for there to be an explanation that goes deeper than the ultimate explanation. So if we're talking about what are the features of the foundation of everything, the foundational explanation of everything, what are its features? Those features can't be further explained. And so all we need then is the principle that there's possibly an explanation for any limit. Well, there can't possibly be an explanation for the limits of the foundation. Therefore, the foundation can have limits. That's the idea. Okay. So let, let's turn to a, a really common objection that you hear. And, and I'm curious to hear how this version, the deductive version of the supreme being hypothesis would sort of deal with this objection, which is basically, why is this better than the universe? Like, why can't the universe be the necessary being that we're talking about? 
and maybe it's even a necessary multiverse. I think this is the view that Graham Oppie defended in your discussion with him on our YouTube channel. Why can't it just be the universe? Like, why does it have to be? Well, I mean, at first I want to say, maybe it could be, right? So like, maybe it is the universe, but then is the universe a perfect being, right? Like, so, well, you know, if you just say it's the multiverse, here's a problem. The multiverse isn't a perfect being because like, so first of all, it has arbitrary limits. So like, if you think about, you know, even if it's infinite sort of in the number of universes, it's not infinite in its density, right? Like there's space between us, for example, like I can move my limbs and stuff. It's not like infinitely dense. So like, so why does it have the geometry that it has? I mean, take the whole multi multiverse and think of the entire multiverse as one giant scattered geometry. Well, that's kind of an arbitrary, I mean, there's limits in there, right? I mean, it's, it's not itself perfect. It, I mean, and if it were perfect, then, hey, we're at the conclusion. There's a perfect being. But I mean, I wouldn't think that people would think of the universe as, right, like having the perfections, maximal knowledge, power, and goodness. But if they did, well, I mean, then God exists and it, it is the universe. A person, <laughs> knowledgeable, <laughs> supreme being, right? Yeah, I mean, we already talked about the, the fact that if we if we assume that the necessary being or whatever the necessary foundation necessary part of reality has no knowledge, then it's not as valuable perhaps as it could be, right? And so maybe that's that's another way that you would look at it. And as I'm saying this, I'm thinking now maybe we need to give some kind of defense as to why knowledge is supremely valuable or valuable at all. And so how do we know? And that's another video. Like I've, I'm I'm telling you, I've watched everything that you've produced. Another video that you talk about is why the supreme being would have these properties or why a perfect being, how do we know what a great making property is? How do, how do we recognize it? Yeah, that's a good question. Right? So, so in this deductive form of the argument, the basic structure is the foundation of things can't be limited in its value. It's got some value because it's got supreme necessary. I mean, it's got the supreme ability to exist without being able to fall apart. It's got some value. It can't be limited, so it's got to have supreme value. And the question is, how, what, do you, what do you do with that? Like, what does supreme value imply? Well, then I think it actually is a conceptual consequence of supreme value that it's going to have just the kind of rate-making properties that we associate with value, knowledge, power, goodness. If, if, I, can, if I compare two beings in my mind, and one has supreme power, supreme knowledge, moral perfection, has these sort of classic theistic attributes. And then I compare that with another being that has, let's say, infinite power, but it's a multiverse without knowledge. It maybe it has some goodness, right, scattered throughout the multiverse. Like, which of these two beings or these two realities has the greater worth? You know, which is like more worth being praised if you want to praise these things, right? Well, it seems like it's the one that includes the additional great making attributes, right? Like has the knowledge, it's got the, the virtues, has everything else. And I mean, it's in a way, it's hard to argue for these things because I think that we sort of see them intuitively by example. If I'm praising my wife and I say, you are so kind and so gentle and so beautiful and so ignorant of, of everything, like, she intuitively knows that that last thing that I said <laughs> was sort of out of step with the first things that I said, right? Like, I don't have to make an argument for that. Or if you call a, a skeptic of the argument we're giving uh, an ignorant fool, like, they're not going to take that as a compliment, right? Because intuitively they understand that, that we're not attributing worth. Um, there's something greater about having knowledge and not having knowledge. Yeah, so by example, right? I think we, we intuitively understand these things by example. And um, I mean, I, I think there is this kind of emphasis in our culture on the five senses, the, sort of seeing things and touching things, hearing things. But right, like we have these other senses, like we have the sense of our own thoughts and we have the sense that allows us to distinguish good emotions from bad emotions. Right. I mean, and that's a real sense. And the way to elicit that sense, I think, is just through example, the way that we would elicit any of our senses. So, you know, one way that one might respond to this kind of argument is to say, well, we can't trust this sense of value at all. 
But my response to that is that, well, if we can't trust that sense, then how can we trust any of our other senses? I mean, part of what we need to do is just like recognize the senses that we have. And we need to do that through examples. If I insult someone, I say, well, you're just so silly and dumb. It's like, well, there's a sense about what I'm doing there, right? Like, and so that plays into the argument and we can appeal to that sense. All right. So as you were talking, I'm thinking more about how, how to best simplify this and how to, yeah. to really see what, what's really going on here. So uh, I'm thinking now about people versus objects. Okay. So people, we, we generally, most, most people understand intuitively that people are valuable. Other people, people that we love, especially our family members and our close friends, we can see that these people are valuable. But objects, on the other hand, are not as valuable. They're valuable to some extent, but they're not as valuable. Think about when you see a news story and a home has been destroyed and the family, through some miraculous intervention, has survived. And they're all hugging each other and they're thinking, you know, at least we're still here. Like everything else can be replaced, but we can't be replaced. And I think that shows you that everybody pretty much understands that physical material things that are not people are not as valuable as people. And then we can start to question, well, why is that the case? Why do we, why do we value people? Why, why do we automatically assume that people are the things that are most valuable in the universe? And then we can see, well, they have thoughts, they have feelings, they're conscious. Uh, and you know, you can also see that you were talking about ignorance. We tend to value people, I think, and maybe this is wrong of us to do so, but we tend to value people that have more knowledge in a certain area. Depending on the situation that you find yourself in, I'm going to value a doctor with a PhD in medicine over some random person that just walks into a doctor's office. I'm going to value the doctor over the other person. In that situation, that context, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about out loud at this point. Yeah, no, that's good. And we can distinguish between intrinsic value and extrinsic value, right? So you might think that as you gain more knowledge, you you gain more extrinsic value, but that your intrinsic value doesn't change even as you increase in knowledge. But right. So, but the point that you're making, the central point is that people seem to be the locus of value, right? And it doesn't seem, I mean, we not only have the sense that people are have value, but we have an additional sense, which is the sense that a person would have value even if they were not valued. Like even if nobody knew about some four-year-old who was just lost in the woods. And let's imagine that the four-year-old herself has become unconscious or something. So she doesn't even have a value for herself. There's no sense of herself. But we have the sense that even if no one valued someone, that that person would still have value just by being a person. And I think that does say something about people being the locus of value, that we have a sense that senses are evidence, so that they're pointers. And so here, I think our sense of value is a pointer to the reality of value. And so the, the universe, uh, if it's impersonal at its foundational layer, then we'd be missing something of great value, namely the kind of value that belongs to persons. And I think just one, one more point of clarification here is that humans yeah. are not necessarily a thing that are valuable. It's, it's persons being, being a person, because if, yeah. you know, we can imagine any other race and I mean, all you got to do is think about Star Trek or Star Wars. There are other races that we can imagine. Maybe even in our universe, there are other aliens or whatever that, that exists in their persons in the sense that everyone I think understands what a person is. We would, we would then see them as valuable or at least we'd have no reason to think that they were less than valuable if they exhibited personhood. So I, I don't think it's human that necessarily is the thing that distinguishes value here. It's being a person. Yeah. So when we apply that to the universe or we apply this in the, in the broader context of what we're, we're talking about, the necessary foundation, as long as it's a person, not, not doesn't have to be a human is what I'm saying. Yeah. It can just, uh, as long as it sort of exhibits these, these attributes that we typically associate with, persons. Yeah. So let me just add a note here. So here we're talking about a pathway through value. The, the basic argument is that the foundation has some value. How much? Well, the simplest answer, the answer that's the least arbitrary, the least ad hoc, 
uh, is that it has supreme value. And then from supreme value, we uncover other attributes like personhood, knowledge, even, even power. You can go from value to power. A different route that doesn't go through value first is to go to supreme power and then unpack from supreme power the power to know everything because the power to know everything is a power. And if something had maximal conceivable power, but was missing in the power to know everything, then it would be missing in a conceivable power. And so then its power would have a cutoff. Um, and we could say it's an arbitrary cutoff because it has less than maximal conceivable. And so then it brings back that question. Well, why that much rather than more? So there's, there's the path through value, but there's also just a path through power. And that's different from the path that I took in the, in the article you cited from Necessary Being to God, where I looked at each attribute individually. I took a path to power and a different path to knowledge, a different path to goodness. But here we're, we're talking about paths through value and then a path through power. And so here we see there's different lines to explore. Does that make sense? That is really, really helpful. Yeah, very, very helpful. And they're all deductive lines. These are all the deductive lines for exploration. And in the, the article that I have, it's, it's the same kind of thing that you were saying where it's, everything is sort of built on top of each other. Yeah. I go from infinite power to volition to unity to infinite knowledge and then finally to perfect goodness and everything yeah. is sort of built on top of each other. Yeah. So I don't argue for them independently. I argue that they're all sort of connected in a way. Let's, let's turn to uh, another objection and this is going to be more the, the layman is going to raise this type of objection. Layman, just the ordinary person who might be hearing this for the first time. And it's something that actually bothers me in one sense. It's like, we know that the universe exists. So isn't it safer to posit things that we know exist, like the universe? Isn't that way more modest? Why do we need to invoke something so far removed from our experience, like a supreme, perfect being, right? Because we don't have any experience with perfect beings. Yeah, I was thinking about this again recently. It's actually kind of ironic because this theory, the Supreme Foundation theory, or that you might call it the perfect theory or whatever, is what you might think of as the least arbitrary account of the foundation conceivable. <laughs> because, I mean, every other account of the foundation has, by definition, some arbitrary limit or boundary. I mean, the least arbitrary theory of the foundation is the one in which it is simply perfect. It has its value without limit. And so there, there's a certain irony in a way in thinking that a more arbitrary account of the foundation, one that posits arbitrary boundaries, cutoffs, or limitations, would be more probable. But, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking again about my exchange with Ram, and I mean, he is right about something. So it's always safer, like, not to believe something, like, no matter what it is. So, like, for example, just, just to make this point very clear, imagine there's a proposition P. And imagine P is the most probable theory. It's more probable than its negation, and it's, it's more probable than any um, competitor. Um, let's say it's, I don't know, from your perspective, given all your data, let's say it's 85% likely to be true. Still, here's a theory that's even more probable than P. P or not P. So like, if, if I just kind of take the more modest position and, and don't almost like, quote, take the risk of accepting P, just sort of leave it open. I have a more probable theory, just P or not P. And I was thinking about that actually with respect to my conversation with Graham, because it struck me that my account or this Supreme Theory account of the foundation is fully compatible with his account. It wasn't like he was giving an alternative theory. He wasn't. He, he, his theory was that the foundation is a necessarily existing thing. and it has power. He left open whether its power was maximal. He just left that open. He declined to write, like to actually have a view on that. And so his, but his view wasn't incompatible with mine. It's almost like his view, this is maybe a crude way of putting it, is a version, his view of the foundation would be a version of P or not P. Like either the foundation has maximal power or it has less than maximal power, and I'm going to leave that open. But 
Still, that's consistent. Okay, the fact that his view then would be more modest and then more probable than my view is consistent with my view being more probable than its negation. That is to say, <laughs> just to make sure this is clear, the, the theory that the foundation is supreme, that could be more probable than any other theory, including just its negation, the most probable of the theories, even if it's even more probable to say that either it's supreme or not. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's like you're taking a little bit of a risk if you accept something that's even the most probable theory, but it's still going to be the most reasonable of all the alternatives. So, I, I mean, I don't think it's it's going to be less probable to think that the foundation is the least arbitrary and that it's the simplest conceivable. That is, it nature is just perfect rather than something else more complicated like a multiverse or something else. Yeah, I'm just going to bring it back to reality for a second. I think what what you were yeah. what you were explaining there was was really good. It was it was a great way to put it in the sense that I understood it and I'm sure that people who are listening and might be familiar with like more formal logic and stuff might might be able to grasp that. But I think another way of putting it that's a more common way and a way that I'm going to refer to Jay Warner Wallace. I, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but one of the things that he does I and am. he's so great at and and explain and I wish I had this superpower. He has I mean he has the the superpower of being able to explain complex ideas even philosophically rigorously in a way that anybody can understand. And I'm yeah. I'm not trying to put you down, Josh. I'm just saying that this is maybe another way to think about this. I, I need help here. This is good. I appreciate it. These these aren't easy concepts. No, they're not. But uh, one of the things that he does he uses the language of reasonable versus possible. And it blew my mind. It, it was such a simple distinction that he makes here. Instead of what I would typically do is talk about probable versus possible. But those two combined together really put this idea. It's like, well, wait a second. Now I've got to really think philosophically about probable versus possible. And it's like too much to go, too much going on. So instead we can make this distinction between what's reasonable and what's possible. And I think that gets more at the heart of what you're saying. It's like you have either P or not P yeah. or P or Q or whatever, whatever you're saying. And that's basically another way, a, a more complex way of just saying, well, this is, it's still possible that some other explanation is, is correct. And so therefore we should just sort of be in doubt about it. And so that's a thing that he talks about is that, well, anything is really possible, yes. but what we, what we should care about is what's most reasonable. I mean, it's possible that, during the course of our entire discussion right now, recording these two episodes, it's possible that both of us have been influenced by aliens and we're not actually here. We've actually been killed and we're just having these uh, po these experiences post-mortem or something. I, I don't know. I anything is possible. But really what we should care about is what is most reasonable. So I think, I think maybe that's another way of framing it that's going to hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, if we're taking the, the probabilistic route, there are alternative possibilities, but the question is, you know, what's the most reasonable account of the foundation? And I mean, it seems to me that like, how could it not be the most reasonable to think of the foundation as the least arbitrary, the least limited, the simplest, like how, how could that not be the most reasonable? <laughs> how could that not, especially when it has high predictive power, it explains the effects, you know, we didn't get into this, but I mean, if you have a foundation that's, the least limited and so it's got value to perfection and so therefore has the valuable attributes of knowledge power and goodness well that also gives it the resources to produce other beings that have knowledge power value goodness things like us right so it then becomes much less surprising that our universe you know just happens to be finely tuned for conscious beings like us um, and so it's, yeah, it's intrinsically probable. It explains the effects. And I like the way you put it. That's a helpful way of, of sorting this, you know, the reasonable versus the possible. There are other possible theories. Well, I mean, if, if we take the, the probabilistic approach, we can grant that there are other possible theories for sake of argument. Uh, I mean, in the end, I think, no, it's actually not possible for the foundation to be limited because I think necessarily any limit is going to have a further explanation. So, I mean, I think, in fact, it's just not even possible for, their, for the foundation to be anything but perfect. I do think that. But 
I can grant for sake of argument, okay, well, maybe, maybe there are other possible theories. And then we can look at, okay, what's the most reasonable? What's the most probable? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about a million different things right now as you're talking. This is, this is opening up a lot of different areas for me to think about, which is, which is so great. And I hope that listeners are also really benefiting from this because it's, it's, it's really fascinating. Okay, so Jay Warner Wallace, thanks. I don't know if he's ever going to listen to this, but thanks for that, that help for both of us. And let's turn to a, an objection to the perfect being hypothesis, which is a very big objection. And it is basically just the problem of evil. If a perfect being exists, then why is there so much suffering in the world and pain and evil? And why are there tsunamis? Why are there tornadoes? Why is there cancer in children? There's, these are questions I think that a lot of people will say, disconfirm or, or even strongly disconfirms the perfect being hypothesis because this a perfect being why would a perfect being allow all this stuff it seems to to really provide some counter evidence here so and again I, I've, I've already mentioned your other videos you have a four-part series on this question too so let's let's get into it yeah well this is one of the deepest questions and i mean to make it even harder you know think about like what perfection implies it seems like perfection implies like nothing but perfection, right? So, so I mean, if there's this perfect foundation, you might even wonder like, how could it even create anything? Because it's already perfect. It's complete. It enjoys all the value that it could possibly enjoy. And so at a, the most fundamental level, it's maybe puzzling, like how it could even produce anything that's limited or finite or less than perfect itself. And, and it can't create something else that's perfect because, well, part of what it is to be perfect is to be the supreme foundation of everything else. So it's, it's the foundation of everything. So there can't be another foundation of everything. Yeah. And, and I think that just to address this most fundamental problem, like how could a perfect foundation produce anything? I think it's important to make a distinction between uh, maximal value and all possible value. Um, so the Supreme Foundation conceptually has as much value as anything could have, okay? But it doesn't follow that it thereby has within itself like all possible value. So for example, there's the value of your existence, Cameron. Your existence has value. And so you know that value would be missing if nothing was created, right? So we want to make that distinction. I think one of the worries that people have is that, well, look, if foundation has supreme value, then it has all value, but that's a mistake. That does not follow. It doesn't have all value. It has maximal value. And so then that leaves out other possible values, including the value of an interesting adventure with different kinds of beings in itself. If it were just by itself in a world without anything else, then there would be value missing in the world. It would still have as much value as a being could have, but there would be value that's missing in the world. And so this is not to solve all the problems, of course, but it's just to solve this one fundamental problem, how it could create anything at all. I want to try to interject here. Yeah. And instead of, instead of like give a, a layman distinction, I'm actually going to give a sort of philosophical distinction. And maybe you can expand on this and, and, I don't know if you actually discuss this in your videos. Okay, so let me just get to it. So maybe we could distinguish between de re value and de dicto value. So de re value in the sense we're talking about the kind of value that a being has. So this perfect, this maximally great being is a being and that being has a certain level of value. And in terms of a maximally great being or a perfect being, it has maximal value. Okay, and that's the property of that being. But it's another question of whether the world has maximal value or whether the world itself has every kind or, or every type of value that it could possibly have. And I think what you're saying is that it doesn't follow from the fact that this being, this one being has yeah. maximal value, that the entire world or all of reality has all the different types of value. Maybe... Maybe that's another way of, of helping that's right. see the, 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 the difference there. That's good. And that is a philosophical distinction that I'm hoping that you can help put, put a little bit more on. Well, I thought that was a good explanation. 
Yeah, the the one being of the the one idea of de re being of the being versus de dicto of the proposition. You spelled it out in terms of the being versus the world, but the the idea is the same. It's basically what you're trying to say is is good um, that it doesn't follow from a being having maximal value that therefore the world has all the values that there could be. It just doesn't follow. And so that's a good distinction to make because it would be a mistake to say, well, God can't exist because if God did exist, then God couldn't create anything. Well, why couldn't God create something? Of course, that still leaves open other more specific questions about, okay, well, why did God create this particular world (laughs) with the particular kinds of evil and suffering we find? And so we can move on to that. But as far as the general fundamental question, um, it's not clear why a perfect being couldn't create less uh, lesser beings. In fact, I would argue from its perfection that it would create lesser beings. The argument being that because it's perfect, it would have awareness of all these other values that are possible that could be instantiated in the world. And so that awareness would give it good reason to create uh, at least some of those things. I mean, it, it's actually consistent with theism that it even creates uh, infinitely many universes that so it can instantiate all these different values in different worlds. And in terms of additional things that are valuable or, or additional values, you mentioned my existence, but I think that one in in this is sort of more specific to Christianity. One of the things one of the actions I think that is most valuable that a person can do is to exemplify radical forgiveness. So there's a story of a, of an Amish family, of an Amish family whose child was killed in uh, it was a mass shooting or it was a school shooting. And what happened afterwards, just I, it blew pretty much everyone away. It was all in the news stories and everything. And basically what happened was the family of the student that was slain went to the funeral of the shooter, the person who killed their their child. And this is an example of radical forgiveness. That, I, I mean, think about whether or not God, in a world where only God exists, is that value, is that action, is that exemplified in that world? And it isn't. So I think what you're saying here, this is just another example of, of something that is valuable that wouldn't exist in a world where it's just this perfect being. And so there are different types of values. Yeah. And you're not claiming that this value justifies all the evil in the world. You're just pointing to another value that would be missing. So where do we go from here? Well, the problem of evil has layers and layers. And so in my videos, I try to give tools. it's, It's not something that I can solve for people, but I can give people tools that they can use Sort of on their own journeys as they're thinking about it for themselves. And I think I, I think that's kind of the most empowering way to proceed. So the tools that I offer are just these general principles that people can use as they think about these things. Some of these are just distinctions to be made, such as the distinction we just made here between all the values that are possible versus the maximal value that a being could have. That's a helpful distinction. Right? Another distinction Maybe I'll just give one more distinction as a tool and then see what you think about that. But one more distinction is between a evil that happens and it's it's mysterious in the sense that you don't see why it would happen versus it, it could be mysterious in another way in that it's not just that you don't see why it would happen. You, you see that it wouldn't happen you see that a perfect being would prevent it. So for example, let's say you see a cat hit by a car and it's just suffering. So one idea is that you see that suffering and you don't see why that would happen. Why would a perfect being create a world in which something like that would happen? Or why would the perfect being not intervene and stop that? Or what could be happening there is that you see that that wouldn't happen. You see that a perfect being would stop that from happening. And this is an important distinction, and and it helps us to think more carefully about really what's going on, because we have to ask ourselves whether we are in a good position when we see 
a particular evil to see that a perfect being would stop that. Now, maybe we are like in principle, but we have to ask that question because maybe we're not. I mean, here's a reason to be cautious. If a perfect being exists, this being would have a maximal knowledge, which would include knowledge of all possible value, which would then give it knowledge of all possible reasons for allowing various things to happen. And this will include reasons that we probably wouldn't see all the time. I mean, maybe some of them we could see, but it's unclear that we would see all of them. And so, you know, we want to separate the clear from the unclear. Do we clearly see that it wouldn't happen? Or do we even probably see that it wouldn't happen? Or are we in a more modest position where we don't really see what the reason would be? I would argue that we should expect there to be events that are mysterious if God exists. We should expect that. That would be just the thing to expect because God would have a kind of knowledge that would surpass ours and we wouldn't expect to know everything. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't expect to know anything for any of God's reasons. But in any case, this is just the beginning. But we have, we have to distinguish between the seeing that God would prevent it from the failure to see um, that God would prevent it. And that distinction can help us to sort through the cases. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And I don't really have a way of, of making that easier to see. I think that you've actually put it pretty easily, pretty well. I mean, this can be taken to extremes. Some people will say, well, look, if, if you can't see what God's reasons would be, if you're always just in the dark, then like, how can you know anything? Like maybe God's deceiving you right now for reasons like maybe he created you five minutes ago with all your memories. He's deceiving you. And you say, well, God wouldn't do that. Well, maybe he would, but he's, he would do it for reasons you can't see. Right? So, so you have to be like skeptical of everything. And I think that's going too far. So I think this can be pressed too far. So my goal isn't just to press this as an answer to every possible question about evil. It's not. But it does invite a kind of intellectual humility. I think it cautions us from a kind of dogmatism that that says, well, I see that God couldn't have a good reason for that. Therefore, God can't exist. I think that that's also a mistake. So we have to have the wisdom to go between the extremes here. So let me, I'll, I'll just add two things because the problem of evil is something that I have actually done some, some study on. So you, you're talking about really the, the position of skeptical theism. And there's a recent, relatively recent paper out by a guy named John DePoe. He's a, he's a Christian philosopher. He's a, he, what he's trying to do is reconcile natural theology with skeptical theism. I'll be using a lot of philosophical terms in this little spiel that I'm about to give. But what he does is he, he basically says that there are these certain goods, and I don't, I don't have these in mind actually because I, I haven't read the paper closely enough, but he basically says that there are goods that God can achieve through something like skeptical theism, through something like where we're in the dark, maybe not completely in the dark, but we may not know the reasons that God has for allowing certain evils in the world and that there would be goods that would come about by that happening, by us being limited in what we know. And so that's, that's one way I think that that's sort of the way that you're, you're getting at. It's a, he calls it a, a positive skeptical theism. And he also uses a, a meteorologist analogy where basically if you have a, a meteorologist who's like, well, I don't know what is going to happen with the weather. It's just going to be sort of random. And we have these, these things that pop up, uh, a random weather event that pops up. And you're like, well, I don't know. I mean, for, for all I know, this weather event could happen or not based on my model. But instead, you have a model that predicts sort of these random chaotic events then you'd want to prefer the other model that has these that makes these predictions, and I'm I'm sure that I'm botching his argument, but that's the the basic idea is that he he endorses a kind of positive skeptical theism where we where God would have reasons for keeping us in the dark about his reasons for allowing and permitting certain evils in the world because we can see some reason like you said we have some light about the the possible explanations for evil one of them is the the famous free will defense by Alvin Plantinga. He talks about how 
valuable it is that we humans have moral freedom. We can choose between right and wrong, and that is an in incredible value to, to have. It means that we're not robots, basically, that we have the ability to choose between right and wrong, and we can also choose to sort of develop our character in good ways and bad ways. And so that's something that's added to the world through this kind of moral freedom. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a variety of, of theodicies that go beyond skeptical theism, and I think it's important to, to, to think about those as well. I don't think skeptical theism really can do all the work by itself. It's limited in its ability to explain the, the problems, I think. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I was talking about with, with radical forgiveness, I was basically giving a version of the soul-building theodicy, where, where these, we have these virtues that are most valuable when they're exemplified. So it's not enough to have a disposition toward radical forgiveness. You've actually got to exemplify it. You've got to do the action in the, in the world in order for that value to be instantiated. So that's, that's one way of, of answering it is with that theodicy. I also wanted to mention that there are some Christian philosophers like Peter Vandenwagen and even Mike Almeida. Mike Almeida has, has an approach to the problem of evil that we actually posted on our website recently about how God couldn't create a world where there were no gratuitous evils. And gratuitous here, I mean, a pointless evil. So what he says is that typically people think that God's existence is incompatible with pointless evil, that there's always got to be some kind of reason, some kind of loving ultimately loving explanation for all the evil and, and suffering that's permitted in the world. But what he says is that that premise is actually false, that God can't prevent all gratuitous evil. That's impossible. That's, that's his argument. And the only reason why I even point that out is because there are different ways to look at the argument. Some people say, like Mike Almeida does and Peter Vandenwagen, that God's existence is compatible with pointless evil. So we may not see a reason because there is no reason. But then the question is, well, what challenge does that pose to God's existence? Some people say, well, God's existence is only compatible with evils that are explained or have some greater good, some reason why they are exemplified in the world. But that premise can be challenged, just like with pretty much any philosophical argument or position. But anyways, th those are the two things that I wanted to talk about were positive skeptical theism with John DePoe. He has a, a great paper on it, which I, I can actually link. And then the second one was that some philosophers and some of the most brilliant Christian thinkers out there deny that premise that God's existence entails that all evils are, are explained or have some greater good that, that is brought about by them. Yeah. If, and if I could just add one more thought here, one of the theodicies that I develop in my book on the two-stage cosmological argument from contingency, I talk about the problem of evil towards the end, and I talk about... I give a story theodicy where um, it may be, you could think of this as weaving together many other theodicies like free will and soul making, but it puts it all into the context of stories within stories. So like your life is a story. You are the hero of your life story and you're on an adventure of growth, of connection, of relationship, of learning, of discovery. And when we think about like the greatest stories, the stories with the most value, we think of stories where there's um, heroism, there's displays of virtue, the greatest being in the story displays a sacrifice, there's love, there's reward, there's transitions, you know, there's episodes, there's stories within stories. And maybe we could even make sense a little bit of what you mentioned in terms of um, gratuitous evils, because there could be some amount of surprise and randomness um, built into the environment. Here, we can maybe appeal to sort of a meta reason, a reason for having a world in which there could be evils with no reasons. So in a certain way, the evils do have a reason, but in a meta sort of way, it's, it's a reason to have the kind of realm in which there are events that happen sort of unpredictably by accident. And it's all part of the story within stories. And in the end, everything sort of is working out for good, or at least there's that possibility for each person so that there's no tragedy that's unredeemable. Like everything gets used. And so even if you have 
an intense suffering as long as it's finite and it can reap something of value in a soul in a in a person whose story goes on forever then the sort of eternality of that story can make sense like the bigger picture can make sense of the things that we don't see at every moment so the story theodicy is another way of it's another tool i would say for thinking about the connection between the perfect foundation and then our observations i like that a lot I, i'm thinking about you you had you put in my mind thinking about what are the greatest stories that are told yeah and and the greatest story seems to me i mean and i guess what my mind immediately goes to are movies you know i'm thinking about like a yeah my my favorite movies and they all involve a great deal of suffering mm -hmm. right and and the the protagonist has overcome the suffering and confusion. or he's done something to questions yeah. doubts the struggle yes ignorance Oh, okay. So I, I, I was thinking about this too. Have you ever thought, because you mentioned earlier briefly that you said you don't even think it's possible that the foundation could be anything but perfect. So right. my question is, well, from that, could we then just infer that there has to be some explanation for all the suffering in the world, or at least that a perfect being must be compatible with suffering? Yes, I think so. I mean, Part of what happens when you consider arguments is you you have to weigh them. They have different strengths. And I mean, and technically, even deductive arguments could strike you with less than certainty because it's a deductive argument, but you're not 100% certain of the inference, for example. But um, having said that, as I've studied the connections between the foundation and then its supremacy, yeah, I mean, I would say that, that some those connections are things that are seeable and knowable and that if you know them if you can see them then then you're going to think about evil through the lens of a perfect foundation you i mean i guess i guess there would be a problem if somehow you could show for sure that there couldn't be a good reason for some particular instance of suffering but i mean i don't see how that's possible i mean i <laughs> I don't see that. I mean, I have no ability to see that there could not be a reason for particular evils and suffering. What happens is maybe I just don't see what the reason is and I have no idea what it could be, but I don't thereby see that it, there couldn't be a reason. So I think you're right. Yeah. One could argue from the perfection of the foundation to the conclusion that there has to be some reason. All right. Well, what we're, Again, coming up, I think, on an hour and a half in this, uh, this second episode, which is crazy. And there's so much more we could talk about, especially just getting into the problem of evil. But let me just ask you, do you have like another summary that you want to give of stage two? Do you have any other closing thoughts here before we sort of close out this, this uh, two-part series? Well, maybe, maybe I could summarize with that picture of a castle. So if you think of reality as a, as a castle... Stage one gives us a foundation of the castle. And stage two tells us that this is a very special castle indeed, because its foundation is supreme. It's perfect. And I guess that's it. I just wanted to close with that picture, that the, the perfect foundation provides a, even a foundation for understanding the elements within the castle. Because whatever those elements are, they have to be consistent with its ultimate explanation. They have to be consistent with, its, with the perfection of the foundation. And so that can be then a guiding light for your life and also for further uh, inquiry about things. If you're, of course, persuaded by the argument of, from contingency, right? then that can help you on other, uh, on other questions. Throughout these two episodes, you've mentioned a book that you're working on. And I even mentioned reading parts of it. Can you tell us anything about it? Yeah, so I've got this book coming out. Um, it's called How Reason Can Lead to God. And I begin by sharing my story of, of losing my own belief in God and what that was like. And then the pathway of reason that I discovered. And I unpack that in a lot of detail, step by step. And so the purpose of the book is to help people to see a pathway to a treasure. Where and, and this is for people who really want the truth. This isn't for people who are just looking for 
I don't know, like a way of supporting something that they already believe. I mean, it, it you know, it's a resource for that, but it's, it's for people who really want the truth. And um, I, I put my heart into soul, heart and soul into this book, and I'm very excited about it. Um, but yeah, that should be coming out next summer. Awesome. And so where can listeners go to find out more of your work? You already mentioned your website, but I still want to talk about your YouTube channel. What do you have coming up there? So I am upgrading it. We have a new studio. I'm uh, just beginning to make some new videos. And I almost hesitate to talk about it because I want to create these new and improved videos and then begin to release them week by week. So if people were following that, I was releasing them week by week and then I've taken a break to upgrade it. But yeah, it's called Worldview Design. And the whole purpose of it is to empower people, to equip people to develop their own worldview. And I think that I've, I'll just tell you this, I, I think that I've made a little bit of a shift. So in the beginning, when I was creating the videos, it was just experimental. I just started making videos and I went by the philosophy of let's just produce and learn as we go. And so that was good. And I'm proud of the videos that I made. But I, I feel like as I was producing those videos, I concentrated a lot on, on giving these particular arguments and that's fine, but I really want to emphasize the empowerment piece that, that the worldview design is for empowering people who maybe they feel a little bit lost in the world. Maybe they, they, it's hard to see clearly and it's to give them tools to help them to build out their own worldview. Like each person has to take responsibility for building their own worldview in their own terms. It's not about me trying to give my worldview but it's about empowering people to build their worldview. So I want to give people tools and principles and, and strategies for doing that successfully. So that's what that's about. And then tell us about your website as well. So joshualrasmussen.com. People can go there for additional resources. I have some of my published articles there and links to things that I've created that they can find at that website. Cool, yeah. And then, and then in addition to that, I mean, you and I... I plan or I, uh, I foresee us working a lot together in the future. And so if you're listening, you're probably going to see Josh again. We may have him on for a discussion. We may have him on for more podcasts. I don't know. The sky's the limit. So, well, Josh, thanks for coming on. Thanks for spending so much time with us. Thank you. These two episodes. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Likewise. It's been fun. Thank you. Yeah. And so if you're listening and you want to learn more about us, Go to capturingchristianity.com. That's the easiest way to do it. Don't forget to check out the shop. We have a bunch of different t-shirts and stuff. There's actually one that says, by the way, Christianity is true. That's our slogan. So you can go there. You can buy t-shirts. And we also have some PDFs there. We're starting to put those up on the, on the shop there. And then if you haven't subscribed, make sure to do that too. So when you, when you go to the website, you'll see a, a button down at the bottom uh, and what you can do actually is get a, a free PDF copy of our book. It's a ebook called The Rationality of Christian Theism. That's free to you if you just sign up and subscribe there, put in your email. But before we get too, too long here, I'll just say thanks guys for joining us. And I hope that you enjoyed, enjoyed these two episodes. The contingency argument is something that I really have a big passion for. And you can see that Josh does too. So if you have any questions, comments, Feel free to leave them in the comments. Feel free to go to the website and leave them there. Go to the Facebook page, whatever you want to do. But anyways, we'll see you guys later. All right, peace. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work. People like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?